Hi, guys. So, I first of all, I need to start off by talking about this thing. I love the hat. Oh, I got a message. Okay, we'll bring that up in a minute. Um, so, I love the hat, and, you know, this ear works great. As you can see, it's starting to slide down my head a little bit because it didn't fit, but you want to use this ear? It, like, wants to run off my head, so. It doesn't, uh, I don't get the Tropic Thunder thing. I've actually never seen the movie. So, J-Rock, thank you again for the hat. Or however you guys all put that together. So, if I do them together, it kind of, like, stabilizes a little bit. But now I got to, like, wear it all crooked. So, now it's, like, premier. But, yes, the sexual harassment. Panda. So, we're going to, we got to work on this. I need a little bit of elastic so it sits on my head right. It doesn't fly off. So, we'll work on that, I guess. Those are for weeb girls. Never go full weeb. Well, I did not buy this, so it's a gift. It's from you and Shiat. So it's okay. And he's going to sit right here until we get them all fixed up. Ready for use. Um, I, I know, I, I but I, all I know from Tropic Thunder is the part where Tom Cruise screams at the Asian gorilla dude. So anyway, we are going to start George Kelly. George Kelly is accused of... Shooting a couple of uh, legal aliens that were crossing the border um, at his ranch in Arizona, um, in Keno Creek, which, you know, it's a very, very apropos name for the type of content we've got. You know, people that own ranches down on the border have run into the cartels with armed gangs. And, you know, that's going to be part of the issue here. And the opening arguments are really long. They're like an hour and a half each. But it's the defense is really, I think, that shows us um, what's going on. This trial is just wrong. Yep. Yep, it is. But we'll watch it and we'll see what's going on here. And I know the, the first day is the closing argument or the opening arguments, but I think we need to watch it. We should watch it. And then, you know, if I turned out I'm wrong, oh, well. You know, like Becky with the good hair, I just don't care. So we're going to get started. And it's interesting because even long crime, the way they... Uh, Look at how they explain this. Bombshell evidence revealed. Well, you know, guess who's guess who's doing the bombshelling? And it's not the it's not the state. The defense reels some real bangers. So, oh, hold on here. I got a. Uh... Um. So here we go, guys. Let's get started. First up is the state is the prosecutor's uh first up is the prosecutor. Now George Kelly's 75 years old, so any jail sentence for him is pretty much a death sentence. Uh but they're seeking second degree murder and that's that's gonna be life for him. So here we go. Thank you, Arnie. January 30th of 2023, at 2.30 in the afternoon, George Allen Kelly walked out of his house armed with an AK-47 semi-automatic assault rifle and a 40 caliber handgun, and he opened fire on an unarmed man and an unsuspecting man. Now. This is not a very this this prosecutor does not you have to have a little bit of theater presence there and she's just like well something kind of happened a while back. I mean there are women who do a very good job at delivering a statement. This is not impressing me. As I was saying, Mr. Kelly armed with an AK-47 semi-automatic assault rifle. Based using an AK platform, blah blah based and a 40 caliber handgun walked out of his house and opened fire on two unarmed men who were unsuspecting. Those men were 115 yards away from Mr. Kelly and his residence. That's the length of a football field. Those men 
Daniel Ramirez and Gabriel Quinn Bukimana posed no threat to Mr. Kelly and no threat to his wife. They were walking parallel to the Kelly residence headed back to the United States-Mexico border. Before firing on those men, George Allen Kelly gave no verbal warnings of any kind. He had no interaction of any kind with these men. Out of nowhere, without saying a thing, without any legal justification, George Allen Kelly let off a barrage of semi-automatic assault rifle fire at these two men. He stood on his back patio and he shot that semi-automatic assault rifle through the patio, across a fence line, through a pasture where he keeps his horse, across another fence line, and across a dirt road, and into the back of Gabriel Quinn Pukimena. Now Daniel Ramirez was just steps away from his companion when he saw Gabriel shot in the back. And he saw Gabriel fall to his death. Yeah, guys, this lady in the back is an interpreter. She needs to be able to see the face to help interpret. Daniel had to run for his life because the shots were still ringing out all around him. The state anticipates that Daniel will come here to tell you about what happened to him that day. Ladies and gentlemen, that is State versus George Allen Kelly in a nutshell. On the screen you see in front of you, on your right, you see a still photo of the video interview of George Allen Kelly on the day of the murder. On the left is a photograph of the view from George Allen Kelly's back patio as you look out toward the area where Gabriel fell and died. <coughs> this is a photograph of Gabriel Quinn Bukimea. And I'm going to ask you to do something in this case that George Allen Kelly's own words tell you that he did not do. I'm going to ask you to consider Gabriel Quinn Bukimea as a person, as a human being, and not as George Kelly described him, as an animal. Now again, this is the view from George Allen Kelly's patio. You'll see you're looking out uh, from his patio, um, across, out past his gazebo, and towards that pasture area I described a minute ago. And it's past that pasture area, past a dirt road, is where Gabriel fell and died. I want to show you the view from the other direction. This is the view through the pergola, or the gazebo, and back toward the area where George Allen Kelly was standing. And you'll see in that photograph, um, Sort of on the right, as you look through the gazebo, a door. That's not the main door into the residence. There are actually two doors on this back patio. There's another door that's directly behind that umbrella. And we'll show you another picture later um, that shows that door, but that's actually the door that George Kelly came out of. To the left of that in the photograph are two <coughs> windows. Those are the windows uh, to the living room area and behind the living room area is actually the kitchen area. This is a photograph of the semi-automatic assault rifle, AK-47, that George Allen Kelly shot and killed Gabriel Quinn Bukimea with on January 30th. And I want to point out a few features on this weapon. There's a green strap on the weapon. And these um, details become relevant when you hear the 
when you hear the uh, officers talk about what they observed uh, George Kelly carrying later on in the day. So there's a green strap on the handgun, <coughs> pardon me, and you'll see that there are some wood features on the AK-47 also, and that the uh, metal on the weapon is a little bit aged from use. So you can kind of see that, uh, I think they call it bluing, a little bluing on the weapon. And if you look on the, on the front end of the weapon, you'll see that taped with black electrical tape is a flashlight with an orange button on it. And just below the AK-47 is what's referred to as the magazine. Sometimes it's called the clip because that's what holds the bullets that clips inside the gun. And that magazine holds 30 rounds. And rounds are what they refer to, how you refer to the bullets that go into an AK-47. They're called rounds. So this AK-47 holds 30 rounds. It also holds one round inside the weapon itself for a total of 31 rounds. And you'll hear from the experts in this case that this entire magazine can be expelled, can be shot within less than six seconds. This is just the other side of the AK-47 for you to see um, and a better view of that green strap that we referred to earlier. This is the 40 caliber handgun that George Kelly had on his hip that day when he exited his house. Now I want to go back to this view from George Kelly's patio um, because there may be something that you didn't notice about this photograph. And that is that off in the distance there is a detective standing in this picture wearing a black polo shirt and a tan pair of pants. He's not a small detective. He's uh, about six feet tall. He's a good-sized detective. And that detective is standing in the spot where Gabriel Felon died in this case. And that red circle with the red arrow is pointing you to where the detective is. And if you still can't see it, that yellow arrow is now pointing directly at the detective. That's how far Gabriel and Daniel were when the defendant opened fire on them that day. Now I want to turn to the area uh, where Gabriel's body was located. This is a photograph of Gabriel, uh, Gabriel's body in place. And what you see in this photograph, first I want to point to the background of the photograph. You see some lights in the background? That is the Kelly residence. And so you can see them sort of off in the, in the, at the top part of the photograph, off in the distance. Now below that, or and just in front of that, you see a tree. Now keep your eye out for that tree because we're going to go through some other photographs and some drone footage later, and you'll want to have that as a marker when you're looking, when you're looking for things. In the foreground of the photograph is Gabriel's body, and you'll see that the grass was very high, and um, probably about two feet at the time, and it's that yellow straw grass. And you can see that Gabriel's body was very difficult to see in that terrain. Gabriel um, is wearing some tan boots, some tan pants, an olive colored jacket, and a camouflage backpack. This is a close up, a big, uh, closer up picture of Gabriel. Again, you can see the tan boots, the tan jacket, or the tan pants, pardon me, the olive colored jacket, and you can see a camouflage fanny pack uh, along his side. And you can see the camouflage backpack, which is kind of up over his head. <coughs> And you can see from these photographs that Gabriel is unarmed. There are no weapons in these photographs. There were no weapons located near Gabriel's body. In this photograph, you can see the blood seeping through uh, Gabriel's jacket on his back where he was shot. And Gabriel was shot here on his back. And this is a close-up of the gunshot wound. You can see the gunshot You can see the gunshot entry wound um, on his green jacket. And you can see that the blood has seeped around on the jacket. Also in this photograph, you can see that strap from the fanny pack that's down along the side. In addition to the, um, let me just try to switch out here. We'll see if that works any better. Sorry for the interruption, folks. You can also see in this photograph that um, Gabriel has a radio on his waist. So you can see the, the black, um, 
uh, antenna from the radio sticking up on the side of him. And now I kind of want to give you some perspective on what we're looking at here. We looked at those photographs, we talked about what the terrain looks like. But you'll learn during this trial that we asked from, for some assistance from some other agencies. One of those agencies is the Department of Public Safety. And they have an aerial drone footage. And they came out with their aerial drone and they took some video footage and some photos of the terrain. And you'll see on the left, there's a, and, and what, those drone, what that drone footage allows us to do is take really accurate measurements from those photographs. And you'll see they're overlaid on a computer screen. The, the, the um, officer who operates those aerial drones will be able to give you some real good idea how those, how those work. But essentially what the, uh, what the trooper did is he ran that aerial, dr aerial uh, drone over the area and it gives you sort of like a bird's eye view of what that area looks like. And if you take a look, it's kind of hard to see in the photograph on your left, uh, but you'll see that there's an up and down line in blue and that's the north-south line. And you'll see a, a line that goes left and right. That's your east-west line, that's in red. And the green line is measuring the distance from Kelly's back, back patio where he shot to the area where the victim's body was located. And it's kind of difficult to see the end of the green line, but can you see it's on the other side of that dirt road? That's the location where Gabriel's body was found. Now on your right, you'll see um, a, the still shot of the aerial drone footage. And I'm gonna play that aerial drone footage for you, but I kind of, it goes kind of quick, so I wanna give you a little bit of a preview of what you're gonna see. What you're looking at right now is like three quarters of the top of the Kelly residence. And you can also see the Kelly back patio there. You'll see there's a fountain. You might want to keep that in your mind as a reference when you're looking at some of these photographs. And to the right of that, you see some orange cones. It's sort of in that general vicinity um, that George Allen Kelly shot that day. And those are where we took the measurements from on the patio, was from that, those orange cones. And you'll learn throughout the trial that to the right of the orange cone is the area where the spent shell casings were located in this case. So just to give you some orientation on what you're looking at and what you're gonna hear um, during the trial. But just past this patio, you'll see the gazebo that we saw in the other photographs. Then you'll see a pile of, of metal structure on the right, some kind of smoking pit. And then you'll see a pile of wood just before a fence line. Then you'll see a pasture where the defendant keeps his horse. You'll see the second fence line. And then you'll see the dirt path, the dirt road, dirt path, just past that. And then it's past that that you see the tree we saw in the photographs, and then four orange cones that depict uh, the area where the victim's body was located, where he fell and died. So we're looking at the top of the house. That's the orange cones. We're going through the pergola. There's the wood pile in the first fence line. And it's kind of difficult to see, but if you keep your eyes um, peeled, you'll start to see now the second fence line, and it sort of goes up at an angle to your left. And now you see the dirt road, and the tree, and the four cones where um, Gabriel fell and died. And don't worry if you miss that second fence line, we're gonna play another video um, that, show, that goes a little bit slower and you can, you can have a better look. So on to the next video. Um, again, you see that same diagram on your left, and on the right is the second drone video. So we're looking again at the top of the Kelly uh, roof, and then we're gonna see that same thing, that patio, um, the pergola, or gazebo, and the smoking pit is that metal thing. Then you'll see the, the pile of wood, the fence line, and then keep your eyes peeled for a little bit for that second fence line, and then the dirt road. And there are your orange cones, the gazebo, the first fence line. And then now you can see the second fence line. And you can see it sort of goes off um, diagonally toward the, toward the road. Everybody see that? And then you see the dirt road and the four corn four cones where Gabriel's body um, was located.
And now just to sort of give you some orientation, um, because we looked at those photographs and we saw that Gabriel was shot here. And you could see that the house was this direction. We know he was shot in the back. But to kind of give you a perspective, we know that he fell forward onto his face into the dirt. And so to give you just, and, and this is not to scale, this is just for demonstrative purposes so you get an idea of, of the orientation of the body. You can see that small little person we added there to that screen, that shows you the orientation of the body. So he was face down, head to the south, and feet to the north, with the um, bullet entry lined up with the back of the Kelly house where Kelly shot from. Now based on all of this information and based on what happened that day, George Kelly was charged with two things. He was charged with second degree murder and he was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. The second degree murder um, relates to the death of Gabriel and the aggravated assault with a deadly weapon uh, relates to the shooting at Daniel. So, second degree murder is one of the more complicated crimes. De okay. I'm lucky you all. God damn it. But it's what's... Okay. The dead guy don't speak no English. The wounded guy doesn't speak no English. The dead guy's family don't speak no English. A lot of people involved in this aren't going to be, you know, cannot comprende amble anglais, okay? So, that's why we have interpreters here. Um, that's what that lady's job is. And there's going to be other ones you'll see standing around talking. But, guys, this is on Arizona, down on the border. This isn't like up in Ohio. <laughs> so you don't need a Canadian interpreter. This is all because people, half the people involved in this don't speak English. Call the unified offense. That means there's three ways that the state can prove second-degree murder. You all don't have to agree on which theory of second-degree murder um, the defendant committed you only yes, have to one agree dead, that he one committed injured. one of these theories of second degree murder. And you all have to you all have to be unanimous that he committed the murder. Well hold on here, hold on, wait. How can they testify they're not legal? I mean, because they're illegal, they don't lose like they're a witness to something. They're allowed to testify. I mean that doesn't the their 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 immigration status does not change whether or not they're a witness. Um and typically they've been subpoenaed, and once you're subpoenaed even if, like, let's say you have warrants for court. If you've been subpoenaed, subpoenas, at least, you know, in many states, if not everywhere, oh, trump the warrant. So, like, if you have a warrant for your arrest and you have a subpoena and you show up, you shouldn't be arrested because that subpoena is compelling you to be there. So, um, they shouldn't be in the courtroom with their witnesses. I understand that. But the guy's family's going to have family members and they're going to want to know what the hell's going on. So, Yeah. Yeah, so, but anyways, I hope that makes sense to you guys there. So, here we go. You can just decide that, it, that there are different ways in which you committed it. So I'm going to talk to you about the three ways um, that the state can prove during this trial that the defendant committed the murder. The first way is by proving that the defendant intentionally killed Gabriel Glenn with man, that he shot him, that he intentionally shot him, and that he caused his death. The second way is the state can prove that Kelly caused Gabriel's death by conduct that he knew would cause death or serious physical injury. So those are the two simple ways. The third way is the more complicated way, but it's also the easiest way. So you can, we can also prove that the defendant committed second degree murder by under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to human life, he recklessly engaged in conduct that created a grave risk of death and thereby caused Gabriel's death. So that he behaved recklessly, manifesting an extreme indifference to human life. 
and that he created a great risk of death and did cause the death. And the risk has to be such that disregarding it was a gross deviation from what a reasonable person would do in the circumstances. So that's second degree murder. One of those three ways is how the state proves that the defendant committed, um, committed second degree murder in this case. And I submit to you that the facts of this case, the defendant is guilty on all three of those theories. The second count is aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And in aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, the state has to prove that Kelly intentionally placed Daniel in reasonable apprehension of eminent physical injury. In this case, that's by the conduct of shooting a gun in his direction. That would place anyone in reasonable apprehension of eminent physical injury. That means that they think they're about to get injured. That's pretty much what that means. And that he did so using a deadly weapon. We know he used his AK-47. And now I want to talk to you a little bit um, about the area where this occurred and sort of orient you on what was happening that day. This is just a map of Santa Cruz County just to give you an idea of the location where this happened. We're in Nogales. Um, we can see that on the map there We're in the area that's a little bit white. Um, all the major uh, residential areas in the county are on here. Rio Rico, um, Tubac, Sonoida, Elgin. And you can see those all on the map. You see the area circled in yellow. That is Keno Springs. That is the area where this event took place. And this area, this is a close-up of the area that's at issue, which is really just south of the Keno Springs residential area. And you'll see um, to the right on this map, in white is an area called Pedregoso Tanks. That's an area that's in the National Forest. And as I said, um, Keno Springs is, the residential part of Keno Springs is just to the north of this. And Nogales, where we are today, is just to the west of this area. And to the northeast of this area is Patagonia. And you'll see along the bottom here is the United States-Mexico border. And you'll see this area where the arrow points is right where the border wall ends. You'll see like a dirt road that comes right up from the map where that arrow points um, that the border wall ends, that is right where the border wall ends, right where that road comes directly up from the end of, of the border wall there. Over on the right of this map is the National Forest. And the National Forest, right where the border wall ends, is where the National Forest begins. And on January 30th of 2023, let me go back to that map for a second, Daniel Ramirez and Gabriel Juan Butimea were with a, with a group of undocumented migrants, illegal immigrants, who crossed the border illegally at the end of the border wall. And they crossed the border really early that morning and they hiked up into the National Forest. And they've been hiking all day in that area. And you're gonna learn for, you're gonna meet Daniel, Daniel's gonna come here and testify. And you're gonna learn that Daniel is a really humble guy. Daniel comes from Honduras, and Daniel um, had spent many years in Mexico. He has a fifth or sixth grade education, and he generally works as a farmhand um, on a small, um, in a small village in Mexico. And you'll learn that, obviously, for someone with his educational background and with his occupation, he struggles um, to get by in the off season. And in sometime before January of 2023, he was working a masonry job during the off season in Nogales, Sonora, and he, he met Gabriel Juan Bukimea. And he and Gabriel started talking about getting work in the United States as a roofer. And as they talked, um, Daniel decided that sounded like a good idea. And so he paid illegal um, folks to, tr to um, come across the line illegally. He paid a fee to come across the line. And you'll hear that Daniel was um, traveling across and up and through the National Forest that day with Gabriel and, and with a group of men, about seven, pe seven or eight people all together. And they were traveling up to the National Forest. They traveled most of the day. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon and they encountered some Border Patrol officers. And so they decided to scatter. They took off running all in different directions. Gabriel and Daniel stayed together and they decided they were gonna go back into Mexico and just give this a try another day. And so they were running, fleeing from Border Patrol, running pretty fast for about a half an hour. And 
And it was at about that time that they decided they were going to take a little bit of a rest. They were, they were worn out from running, um, they're headed back to Mexico, and they're going to slow down and take a rest. And Daniel didn't even have time to register that there was a residence around. The only thing Daniel saw was a red horse, a skinny red horse. And he saw that horse off to his right. He's walking along a dirt path. Um, dirt path is sort of off to their right. And he sees this skinny red horse off to his right. And they're walking along, and they see this skinny red horse. And out of nowhere, a barrage of semi-automatic assault rifle fire comes their direction. And they're walking, and Daniel sees Gabriel just a few feet ahead of him get hit in the back with an assault rifle fire, with the assault rifle fire. And he sees him grab his chest and say, I'm hit. And he sees him fall in front of him and die. And then Gabriel, because the shots are still ringing out all around him, takes off running and runs for the border, running for his life. Now at around 2.30 that day, George Kelly came to his house to have some lunch. And he was in his kitchen, making his lunch at his kitchen island, when he sees something outside that catches his attention. And just started to give you a little bit of an idea, George Kelly's house is about a, a little less than a mile and a half from the United States-Mexico border. His property is about 170 acres, and it's surrounded by a large ranch, the Buena Vista Ranch. The Buena Vista Ranch is on the west side of his property, so the Nogales side, and the south side of his property. On the east side of his property is National Forest, and to the north is that Kino Springs residential area. And George Kelly was in his house that day, making his lunch, when he saw something outside that caught his attention. Instead of calling 911, he has his 40 caliber handgun on his hip. He goes to his back door, grabs his AK-47, and tells his wife to call the Border Patrol. To call the Border Patrol Ranch Liaison specifically. And his name is Jeremy Morcell. And so Wanda Kelly picks up her phone, calls the Border Patrol, and George Kelly goes outside and lets off a barrage of semi-automatic assault rifle fire. These are the two weapons that George Kelly had that day. We've already talked about those. And again, this is the view from George Kelly's back patio where he went out and let off that semi-automatic assault rifle fire. And that's the area where Gabriel and Daniel were that Gabriel fell and died. This is Jeremy Morcell. Jeremy Morcell is that ranch liaison that um, George Allen Kelly's wife called that day. The job of a ranch liaison is kind of just what it sounds like. Border Patrol needs to have access to properties that are close to the border in order to do their work. And so they work hard to have good relationships with people who are near the border. And the ranch liaison's job is to facilitate that access um, to those properties, to work with the residents to have them allow the Border Patrol to have access, and also to facilitate communication with those folks to make sure those folks know when there's an operation going on so they can stay out of the way, um, so they don't, uh, don't put themselves in the middle of an operation, and so that the homeowners can communicate with the Border Patrol if there's any information that they want to pass on to help Border Patrol with their job. So that's what Jeremy Morcell's job is. So this day, at 2.30, George Kelly uh, calls Jeremy Morcell, and he says to George, I'm being shot at, and I'm shooting back. He says, I can't talk right now. There's five people all running southbound with packs. And Jeremy Morcell will tell you that during that phone conversation, George Kelly was very rushed and very frantic on the phone call. And you're going to wonder, Kim, why are you giving me all these details about these phone calls and these statements? It's because throughout the day, these stories shift from moment to moment with Mr. Kelly. And it'll be important for you to take good notes about what Mr. Kelly says and when he says it and when that story changes because that's a shifting story throughout the day. So that was the first call. 
while that call is happening, Agent Morcell is um, talking to the appropriate people in his dispatch center, um, making sure that Border Patrol gets dispatched out, and also making sure the Sheriff's Department gets dispatched out, because Mr. Kelly has said there's a shooting going on. About 2.36, Jeremy Morcell calls Kelly back. At this time, Kelly gives him a slightly different story. He tells him he had an altercation with these people and they're headed toward Chino Springs, which is now the opposite direction that he said during the first phone call. And he says something about maybe they're trying to circle back or something of that nature. He says on this call, not I'm being shot at and I'm shooting back, but I heard a gunshot in my direction. And he saw his horse running by. And it's unclear in this phone conversation is he outside when he hears the gunshot, or is he inside when he hears the gunshot? And that changes again later, whether he's inside or he's outside when he hears this alleged gunshot. A gunshot, by the way, that no one else hears other than George Allen Kelly. When he's on this conversation at 2.36 with Jeremy Morsell, he says that he's inspecting his horse and that it doesn't look like his horse was shot. Now the horse is going to be important because you're going to hear from Daniel about the horse and how Daniel believes that the horse got shot. And he believed at the time that the horse got shot, and he thought the horse saved his life. From his view of what was happening at that time, that's what he thought happened. And clearly, George Allen Kelly also thought something happened to his horse because he's busy inspecting him at this point. George said that, that and this is the important piece of this phone conversation, the people were too far away to tell if they had any kind of firearms. 115 yards away, they were too far away to tell if they had any firearms. George Allen Kelly could not tell if they had any firearms. And we saw that from the picture we saw a few minutes ago about the location where Gabriel fell and died. During this phone conversation, he was quite a bit calmer than he was during that second phone conversation. So the next thing that happens is officers have been dispatched out and the Border Patrol gets there really quick. They're there within about 10 minutes. Um, this is a pretty remote area, so that quick of a response time is pretty, pretty great. So when the Border Patrol arrives, um, the first Border Patrol agent, there's two Border Patrol agents in total who, who go out to the scene during this first call for service, and five sheriff's deputies respond. When the first deputy arrives, um, or the first Border Patrol agent arrives, he learns that Mr. Kelly is headed south um, in the property, that he's taken off south from his house on the property. And before they go looking for Mr. Kelly, they decide they're going to search the area of the house for any kind of immediate danger. So they kind of split up, um, but actually six of them, because the fifth deputy doesn't get there until pretty much everything's done. Um, so the six of them split up. They search that immediate area, the pasture by the house. They search the area around the house. And they tell Mrs. Kelly, stay in the house. We're going to go, we're going to go look around. The Border Patrol agents head off, they just sort of hike straight across the, the property, and you'll see that they locate Mr. Kelly about a quarter mile south of the house, um, not far from a barn and a, and a mechanical pump house, like it's a pump house where you pump w water from a well in the ground, so it's got a little pump house, and it's down in that area that the Border Patrol find him. And when they do find him, by the way, they see him walking with his dogs, He's carrying an AK-47, and there's, they don't locate anyone else. No, none of the deputies, none of the border patrol locate anyone else uh, while they're there. This is a, a map just to give you an idea of the Kelly property. And you'll see at the top of the map in white is the Kelly residence. You'll see that area in blue is the area of the residence. And around the edge of the blue line is about where Gabriel's body was located. The area in green is the barn. Um, they have a big metal barn. It's that metal barn near that area. And this yellow circle is the, is the pump house. It's in that area where the um, Border Patrol find Mr. Kelly walking in that location. Just one other thing for you to note for the property. There's also an area here of corrals and some water troughs. That may at some point during the trial, you, you may want to know where those are just to give you an idea. And you'll see that there's a dirt road that goes through the property. Um, that's the, just the Kelly's uh, sort of driveway through their property. 
And you'll also see in this map that there's a, a wash that one runs through the Kelly property. You can kind of see that in the drone footage we looked at. Off in the background, you can see a little piece of the dirt road and you can see the, see the um, wash that's kind of down below. But those are just some items for you to have an idea of so that they may become important during the trial. There's something so much. Yes, sir. about an hour and a half and uh, they need a break as to the interpreters keep going too much farther beyond that but all the data we have suggests generally that we own the mistakes so we'll take a 10 minute recess uh, and um, we'll continue with the opening statement. Goodbye. All right guys so we're taking a bit of a break here um so, I mean, this is not an impressive argument so far. This is very snooze-tastic. Um, I, you know, this is, yeah, this is also why you don't talk to the police. And these are the opening statements right now, um, for George Kelly. Is it unclear or does it change? <clears throat> yeah, this, this whole thing is just, a, yeah. Was he even shot at? No. But there were a lot of people on his property transversing back and forth armed. So, yeah. But he does talk to the police. And that's one of his big problems. So. Yeah. So. That's kind of where we are right now, guys. Yes, could you not talk to the police? Yes. But I'm sure George Kelly's like, oh, I'm good, old boy. I'm, you know, I love America and I love the police. And now he's finding out, yeah, that's not how this works, home slice. So just causes, where are the charges on the illegals? I mean, what, charge them with trespassing? I mean, the state really can't charge them much. That's up to the feds. So um, president like Phil Swiss has discovered MSNBC and others have been filling their comments with fake anti-Trump comments from accounts with names of various period dash number combos. And he says, each account has 100 plus comments on NBC or others. That's not a surprise, man. That's how they do it. That's how they, uh, it's, you buy them on Twitter, you buy them here. That happens all the time. But this, this, uh, this case is a snoozer from the state at this point. I mean, this woman does not inspire like fire and zeal or anything like that. Also, I like this case. They take long breaks in this court today. 15 minutes. We're taking a 15 minute break and, you know, almost 30 minutes later. So here we go. So we're going to, we're going to pick back up with this. We're going to pick back up with this guys. Okay. I know this argument's annoying and boring, but we got to get through it. Communal toilet experience. It's very important. It's very important for jurors to bond. <laughs> it's not the kind of way we hope you bond, but uh, you just had your first bonding experience this year. So hope it went well. But what we'll do then is we'll break for lunch. I'm going to have you come back after lunch. We're going to continue with the opening statement. Um, and uh, we'll break for lunch. I'll have you come back at 1.30. But if they haven't fixed it or telling us that they can fix it, you know, in a very reasonable amount of time, then we're just going to have to resist for the day because I'm going to have to make all of you continue with your fun bonding experience. I think once is probably enough. So we'll do that, all right? Um, again, it just happened. That we just found out about it. It's nothing to do with our building, the, the whole complex, the jail. Um, everybody's got without water, it'll probably be citywide. All right. Um, any questions about that? So that's the plan. Come back after lunch. Hopefully it'll be fixed, or soon we'll be fixed and we'll be able to continue. If not, then we're just going to have to recess for the day. Any questions? Sound good? All right. You know what I know. You can continue with your open statement. So we were talking about. Uh, about 3 o'clock, 3.15 that afternoon, uh, the Border Patrol located Mr. Kelly, and they found him walking with his dogs, and he was carrying his AK-47. It was that AK-47 that has the green strap on it with the wood um, pieces to it and the, and the metal. And one of the officers actually noticed that the 
AK-47 had a flashlight taped to the end of it with black electrical tape. And during this call for service, the officers had all split up into separate teams, so they took three separate statements from Mr. Kelly during this time. And we'll go through those uh, during the trial, uh, but we're not going to go through all of them here today. This is the first statement that George Kelly gave about 3 o'clock or 3.15 to Deputy Castaneda. And Deputy Castaneda was the lead, lead officer uh, for the Sheriff's Department that responded to this first call for service that day. And what George Kelly told um, Deputy Castaneda is that he was standing in his kitchen, which is sort of in that red dot area on the house, um, and he looked through his kitchen. Um, there's, a, there's a wall between the kitchen and the living room that has like a cutout for a counter. So he looks through the cutout um, and from the kitchen, through the cutout, through the living room, and out the living room windows, and he sees uh, movement outside. He says that he sees five people running south from that view. Again, that's the living room windows. We looked at those pictures a minute ago. You're looking at the back of the house, and so you see the living room windows, the living room, that wall, the cutout for the counter, and then the kitchen island, and he was standing at that kitchen island. This is that other photograph. You see now why I included the photograph that was not a crime scene photograph, that has um, other vegetation that showed that other door, um, because this is a dark photograph and it's harder to see. But in this photograph, you can see both doors. You can see the door to the right, which is the door into the master bedroom, and you can see the door on the left, which is the door into the main living areas of the house. That's the door, circled in blue, that George Kelly came out that day. And on the left are those, are those two kitchen windows. And what Kelly said he did was that he went to that east door, he grabbed his AK-47 that he keeps by the door, and he went outside, and he saw people were possibly carrying rifles. That's what he tells Castaneda during this, um, this interview. So we know this is different from what he told um, Agent Marcel on the phone. He told Agent Marcel they were too far away to tell, and now this time he says they're possibly carrying rifles. <coughs> And then he goes on to say that he heard a single gunshot from an AK-47, and he believed that the people had encountered another cartel, and they shot at them to scare them off, and that's why he saw them running. He said he saw the people approximately 100 to 150 yards away from the residence, and that after that, he never saw them again. So all he sees is people 100 to 150 yards away from the residence, and he never sees them again. He says he walked back through his property to locate the people, but he didn't find them, and that's when the police arrived. He says, he tells Castaneda, he believes there's way more of them than he saw out there, but he's just speculating. He doesn't really know or have any reason um, to make that speculation. He's just speculating. <coughs> and Castaneda tells Kelly that if anything like that happens again, stay inside your house and call 911. And Kelly says something very interesting at that time. Kelly says, he understands Captain Ed has given him advice, but he's going to do what he had to do to protect his property. He was conscious of the consequences, and he would take responsibility for his actions. The deputy reiterated to him again, stay inside and call 911. Here's the important part about all of these three statements that he gave to law enforcement that day. He never one time admitted that he shot his AK-47. He never told law enforcement that anyone pointed a gun at him, and he never told law enforcement that he was in fear for his life at any point that day. The next um, thing that happens in this case is Deputy Marcel gets another phone call after law enforcement leaves that day. And that phone call comes in about 423 that afternoon. And Deputy Marcel, I, I believe, is already off duty at this point, and he takes the call from Kelly. And Mr. Kelly tells him that he's very thankful for the responsiveness and how quickly the agents got there, and he wants to meet up the following day to sort of debrief about what happened. And Agent Marcel will tell you that that's kind of a normal thing if there's some kind of border patrol incident, that the, that the ranch liaison will go meet up with the homeowner. So that wasn't an odd request by Mr. Kelly that day. He said that during this phone conversation, Mr. Kelly just started rambling on um, during the phone conversation, and he was getting super excited about what had happened earlier that day. And then he started telling the story again about what happened, and he started sort of uh, embellishing on what he told him earlier that day. 
He said he and Wanda were in the house and they heard a gunshot. And now you'll hear this is different. Instead of hearing the gunshot when he's outside, he's hearing the gunshot from Anything you say and do, guys, will be used against you. I mean that with all sincerity. You have a gun taped to your flashlight. You have a... You wouldn't tape a gun to your flashlight. You have a flashlight taped to your gun. But you sound like a bad guy. But if he didn't have a flashlight on his gun, he was being reckless out in the night with the gun. You see how this goes? It goes both ways. You just got to accept it while you're doing it. It's not an illegal modification. You're right. Um, they should object and say it's not illegal because that's not illegal. That's a, that is a conclusion of law, but yeah. Um, so yeah, chili got thrown in the hole. That's nice. Thank you. Content lasagna. <laughs> but yes, I, I do have a problem with that, but I was going to let it get done. Um, but yes, we can. Yes, he had a gun taped to a flashlight. Yes, to his flashlight. But yes, we can just just notice how she's explaining this again. We'll just we're gonna rewind that a hair just so she can talk about it. I think this is far enough back. Here's the important part about all of these three statements that he gave to law enforcement that day. He never one time admitted that he shot his AK forty seven. He never told law enforcement that anyone pointed a gun at him. And he never told law enforcement that he was in fear for his life at any point that day. The next um, thing that happens in this case is Deputy Marcel gets another phone call after law enforcement leaves that day. And that phone call comes in about 4.23 that afternoon. And Deputy Marcel, I, I believe, is already off duty at this point, and he takes the call from Kelly. And Mr. Kelly tells him that he's very thankful for the responsiveness and how quickly the agents got there. And he wants to meet up the following day to sort of debrief about what happened. And Agent Marcel will tell you that that's kind of a normal thing if there's some kind of border patrol incident, that the, that the ranch liaison will go meet up with the homeowner. So that wasn't an odd request by Mr. Kelly that day. He said that during this phone conversation, Mr. Kelly just started rambling on um, during the phone conversation. He was getting super excited about what had happened earlier that day. And then he started telling the story again about what happened, and he started sort of uh, embellishing on what he told him earlier that day. He said he and Wanda were in the house, and they heard a gunshot. And now you'll hear this is different. Instead of hearing the gunshot when he's outside, he's hearing the gunshot from the inside. And we went out onto the porch. He went out to, onto the porch, and he saw his horse running by. And Wanda saw it, too. There were 10 people all loaded down with AR-style rifles, 10 to 15 of them had rifles. So this is the this is the story at 4:23. And again, um, the agent will tell you that he was super amped up during this phone during this phone conversation. I don't disagree um, differently with you. than his conversation earlier in the day. An hour goes by, and Jeremy Marcel misses the phone call from George Allen Kelly, and this is the phone call that he missed. Voice Jim, this is Alan Kelly. You need to call me immediately. This is serious. Call me immediately. I can't say any more over the phone. Bye. Then after that voicemail message, which Jeremy Marcel will tell you that was an unusual tone of voice for Mr. Kelly, he got this text message at 5.26, also saying, call me immediately. Agent Morcell, about 5.35, at this point, he's off duty. He's actually at the gym working out, and he just didn't hear his phone ring um, when, it called the first time, when he called the first time. He didn't catch the text message. And he happens to walk over and notice that he's missed a text and missed a call. And so he tries returning Mr. Kelly's call. They kind of play some phone tag back and forth. They're both trying to call one another. Eventually, they connect um, on the phone, and there's another phone conversation at 535. During this phone conversation, Mr. Kelly's demeanor is completely changed. He's evasive, he's nervous, he's scared, and his demeanor is totally different. He's a totally different person. During that fourth phone conversation, Kelly says, this is worse than you can imagine. This is bad. And he just kept repeating that. 
Morcell then offers to him to send out um, the sheriff's department and uh, the border patrol. And he tells him, just tell me what's happening so that I can tell folks what you need. And Jeremy and Mr. Kelly tells him, um, is continuing to be evasive. And Morcell then suggests that Kelly call 911. If he needs help, if something's happening, that he should call 911. And Kelly says to him, you need to get border patrol. This is a border related issue. And then he tells him, you know how shots were fired earlier? Something was possibly struck. And as Morcell continues to push for additional details, Kelly tells him, I can't tell you more over the phone. And then he asks Morcell, is this being reported? He somehow thought that a conversation with a law enforcement officer wasn't going to be reported if it was the Border Patrol. So, Mr. Kelly did not take Agent Morsell's advice. He did not call 911. But Agent Morsell called his dispatch, and his dispatch called 911. And then 911 called Mr. Kelly. And when 911 called Mr. Kelly, the, night, the dispatcher had a very interesting conversation with Mr. Kelly. When she first speaks to Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kelly says, it's very serious, ma'am, and I can't, I'm not going to talk over the telephone. Yeah, I know I can talk to you, but you're responsible for what I say, and I'm responsible for what I say. Uh, I didn't shoot at any, I haven't said I shot at any, and then his voice quivers and he says anything. I don't want to get you in trouble. And I, I don't want to get me in trouble. Okay, he sighs. You know, you know the thing. You have the right to remain silent. And anything you say can and will be held against you in a court of law. I'm not, I'm not admitting to anything I've done. But all those things tend to add up. And I don't know what happened. I just know, I just know what I saw about 15 minutes ago. And then when the when he eventually gets to the point that he's marked a body with a flashlight, he tells her, I have it marked, I've got a flashlight on over it. And the dispatcher says to him, do you know who it is that you saw? And he says, no, I didn't say I saw any body. I just saw a body. And then he goes on to say, and from, from what in that, in that I only approached the body to make sure that the, that the animal, uh, it's not a vegetable or a mineral, the animal wasn't alive, and it was not alive. There was no signs of blood. Uh, there was just a, a, an animal laying face down, an animal. And you know what an animal is. It's not a vegetable or a mineral, it's a body. And you know what I'm talking about. But I think more than the words of what he said to dispatch, when you hear the tone of what he says during this call, you'll see the impact of what it is that he's saying. times where you're allowed to produce like things that have happened to talk about your open like talk about what's going to happen in your opening statement but this is borderline basically a straight presentation of her case and i if i was the defense i really would have objected to this because it's one thing to say like yeah here's a phone call he made 
You're going to hear this phone call. You're going to see some of those pictures. But for her to go through this at such a level, I mean, she's she's basically cramming it all in without the the uh, people here. But I'm assuming this was already cleared through evident, like through pretrial rulings. If not, the defense is really sleeping on this one, not getting out in front of it. Now, guys, yeah, here's the thing. I mean, it sounded like, oh, this guy's innocent, but now you're listening to it. Does he really sound as innocent? It sounds like there's some issues because he did speak to the cops. So now his, like, story is changing, and this is happening, that's happening, and yeah. I mean, he's not doing himself favors here. That's why you don't talk to the cops. I can't remember the, the officer's name. There was two gentlemen and two young ladies. Uh, and they started, you know who I'm talking about? They came out to 100 Willow Cross Circle. You, you mean for my... Ariel, you're asking, why is this not using the right not to incriminate yourself against a defendant? Because you, under the Fifth Amendment, yes, there is a right against self-incrimination. You've already made these statements. They're not calling you up there to verify them. You, there's also the rules of evidence. This is not hearsay because it's a statement by a party opponent. So it's a statement by the defendant. His statements can be used against him. His pre-arrest statements, though there's no issues about Miranda. These are perfectly free, voluntary statements. They're allowed to use them. And the, dep and the police can come up there and say, yeah, I talked to George Kelly in person, and he sounds just like George Kelly. And if they want to prove it's not him... Yeah, they could, George Kelly can get up there and say it's not me or prove it's not him. So, yeah, she's got all seven that can't make it interesting. Yeah, that's the other issue here, too. So, we'll see. I don't know how bad she is, but... um, Yes, this is just proceeding with her case and an opening statement. I understand, but it, it's just fucking garbage. I mean, this shouldn't happen this way. So... But I hope that answered your question because th these are all admissible statements. They're it's all fair game. My deputies, correct? And yeah, they were they were. Uh, yes, yeah, I'm aware of what happened here. There, uh -huh. you're aware. Okay, then they're aware of what happened, and uh, I don't want to get you in trouble, and I, I don't want to get me in trouble, or uh, but I don't want to break the law or anything like that. So. What I'm telling you is that uh, we need a sheriff deputy out here, 100 Willow Cross Circle, immediately. And that's all I can say, ma'am. Okay, is uh, anyone hurt? I need to know because if someone's hurt, I need to send an ambulance too. There, there's no, there's no... Okay, do you feel more comfortable talking to a deputy over the phone? Uh, well... In other words, okay, you know, you know the thing. You have the right to remain silent, and anything you can, I uh, you say can, will be held against you. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not admitting anything I've done, but you know, all those things tend to add up, and I don't know what happened. I just know what I, I just saw about 15 minutes ago, and it's something that an ambulance cannot help. EMTs cannot help. Uh, there's, there's, there's nothing out here that, that can be. Aided by EMT uh, or emergency services. There's. Uh... Okay, I understand that you don't want to give me a lot of details, but um, what you are requesting an officer from me, so I needed to know for their own safety and your safety a little bit of what's happening, what's going on. Okay, uh, I'll put it like this: Last spring, out here, uh, there was a, a pickup found on East Sage Rush. Uh, with a dead lady in it. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know if you knew of that or not. Um, uh, yes, I'm, I'm aware of what happened. Okay. It's a, it's a situation similar to that. How's that? Okay. You, you, you follow? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a situation okay. exactly like that. Okay. Um, and so that's going to require the sheriff to come out here. Okay. Can you tell me a description of the no, I, I don't. I don't have a description. There's not a vehicle. Okay. Uh, the only thing that I was referring to in conjunction with that act was, was the body. Okay. You got it? Okay. All right. What, okay. Can I have your name? Yes. George Kelly. George Kelly. Okay, George, would you, if my deputy goes over there, would you take him to whatever 
Yes, 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 yes. I have it marked. I have a flashlight on over it. Because uh, it's going to be dark when it gets here probably, but I'll take it to him. Uh, just, uh, and you are sure an EMT cannot help? I am positive. I have a medical background. An EMT cannot help. Okay. Do you know whoever it is that you saw? No, I do not know. I didn't say it was anybody. I just said it was a body. Okay. All right. Okay, all right. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to be smart, ma'am. Well, I'm, 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 you're trying to be careful, and I get that. However, um, I hope you understand that on my end, I have to take care of my deputies, too. So I'm yes, going to a little bit more context as to why you needed a deputy to head out there. Now you know that <laughs> there is a body here. Okay, all right. Does it look um, somewhat... It's, it's not alive, so you asked if you need an MC. I said no. Okay. I'm sure a coroner, a coroner will be involved sooner or later. I just said, uh, George, can you tell me something? Um, is it discolored from somewhere? Is it discolored? Yes. What does that mean? Um, has it been there for a while? Can you tell? Uh, from from what? In that in that I only approach the body to make sure that the animal, uh, it's not a vegetable or a mineral, the okay. animal wasn't alive and it was not alive. Okay. Uh, there were no signs. There was no signs of blood. Uh, there was just a uh, uh, an animal laying face down. An animal? An animal, and you know what an animal is. It's not a vegetable or a mineral. Okay. It's a body, and you know what I'm talking about. I understand what you're talking about, George. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to send the deputy then over to your house so you can meet them over to wherever you found what it is. Okay. okay? And now, uh, maybe... One of the deputies around here, they know how to get here because it's one under waterfall circle and it's kind of hard to find. It's a rat right on the border. So, so I have one of my deputies that responded earlier going over your way. That's good. You do that. They know how to get here and I'll have the gate open. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate your help and your patience and I'm sorry about that. No problem. I accept. Okay. Okay. Bye. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. It was just a few minutes after that um, that the first deputy arrived for this second call for service. And that was Deputy Rafael Lopez. And Deputy Lopez had responded to the scene earlier in the day, but he was one of the later deputies. He was that later deputy who got there after really everything had finished up earlier in the day. And what Deputy Lopez did when he got there was he turned on his recorded, recorder. And he recorded um, as soon as he arrived at the scene for a few minutes of what George Kelly was reporting to him. And this is that recording. I'm afraid somebody had shot for this. You know, some of the there was a shot fire and I didn't know what it was about. Okay, so I went out to get the horse. I always bring him in and feed him. Put him in another pasture. I went out there to get him. And y'all guys, did you, you weren't over here? Yeah, I was here. Y'all walked all over there. And the border patrol worked all over. And I, maybe this happened after you left. Well, I don't know. Body There's a body right now. Man, I didn't find it. Yes. Not fresh. I didn't, I didn't, as soon as I saw it, I got away from it. The line flipped the face I have no I have no way of being judges. He was new. You want to do it. The drug on He has a pack on A small pack on Now, if you remember, I we saw five to ten drug runners come through the large pack on Yes. He did not have a large backpack on him, but he has a small and he's in hand here and camo. And, uh, so, I just, as soon as I found him, he came back to the call. I called Lord to know because that was the first ones I called. Because I didn't really know how to call you guys. So I called Lord to know Jerry Ward's head. He called the Lord to know uh, and, and, and he said, they're going to call the sheriff and they don't see someone out there. And your, your secretary or, or dispatcher, I suppose, called me. I was on the phone with her when she drove up. Paul came. And she said he's coming out right now. I have no idea. I have no idea. I have no idea. I have no idea. And you know, if you were me, you got no idea. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, it, yeah. You can pull up all the time I call. Okay. You go ahead. I'll, 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 I'll go get the radio. Yeah. My dog will call. You got this? Huh? Thank <laughs> you. 
Rodriguez arrives at the scene and Sergeant Rodriguez meets up with Deputy Lopez and George Kelly by a horse trailer that's down by a gate um, into, the, into the pasture area of where the, um, where the horse was kept in the, by the house. And what's, when Sergeant Rodriguez arrived about 6.15, he saw that Kelly was wearing that Glock handgun um, still on his hip and he asked Mr. Kelly if he would be willing to take that handgun off for officer safety reasons and leave it behind in the trailer. And Mr. Kelly agreed to do that. He took the weapon off and left it um, in his horse trailer that's right next to the gate in that pasture. From there, Kelly took yes, Rodriguez out to the opening. barn. And they walked around on that dirt path that goes around from the, from the driveway that you saw, that dirt road that's the driveway, they took the dirt path around the outside of the pasture back to where the body was located. And they found the body near that tree that we saw, and the defendant had take, had hung up a flashlight in the tree so that they could locate it, because it was starting to get dark at this point. And as I mentioned before, the sergeant found the uh, Gabriel's body laying face down with his head toward the south, with his face implanted in the dirt. And his um, legs were towards the north. So, and we, we showed a little picture of that earlier on how the body was positioned. And when, when um, Sergeant Rodriguez got a good look at the body, he could see the gunshot entry wound in Gabriel's back. And he could see that that was on the right side of his body, which then lined up with the Kelly's residence. Later, they were able to look and discover that the gunshot exited from the chest. He made another a number of other observations about the body. He saw that there was no pulse. Um, the extremities were were cool, but the torso was still a little warm to the touch. He looked around the area because of the story that Mr. Kelly had about these other people and, and things of that nature. He looked around and he saw there weren't any drag marks, there wasn't a blood trail, there was nothing to indicate there were groups of people nearby. He saw nothing like that in the area. And nothing at all that indicate that a body had somehow been dumped there or anything of that nature. It appeared to, the, to Sergeant Rodriguez as if Gabriel had fallen there and died. <coughs> and he noted, as I said before, that that gunshot wound generally lined up with the trajectory to where George Kelly was shooting from on his back patio. And again, just a reminder of the photograph of how he found the body. And I think we've already gone through all this, but it, it kind of shows you where that gunshot wound was lining up with the residents. And again, just the body positioning with that tiny little stick figure to just show you how the body was lining with the gunshot entry on the house side. Now, a short while, a little while later after they do their investigation there at the scene and they gather the information uh, about what had happened earlier in the day from all their sources, George Kelly's transported um, to the Sheriff's Department for an interview. He's read his Miranda rights and a video interview was conducted of him. And this is the still shot from that video interview that happened about 8.29 p.m. that night. So we're talking maybe six hours after the homicide. And you'll learn that during that interview, George Kelly tells Detective Ayinsa that he was eating lunch in the kitchen and when he looked out through the living room window and he heard a shot. Now he's in the house when he hears the shot before he's outside when he hears the shot. 
He hears a shot. It's close, and he saw sees his horse running by. He says about 100 to 150 yards out, he sees men running with tan shirts and pants with a full brown, big, solid backpack on. He then clarifies that he saw them, and then he heard the shot after he came outside. And he says that he saw them run into the arroyo. He told this whole story without admitting that he shot his AK-47. Never admitted he shot his AK-47. It was about 30 minutes into the interview, and after Detective Ainsa pressed him about conversations that Kelly had earlier with um, Agent Morceau, when George Kelly finally admitted he shot his AK-47 that day. He says to Agent, or to, uh, pardon me, Detective Ainsa, that they were running, and he moves his hand from left to right, parallel with me. They were parallel to the house. I'm telling you the truth, I made, did not make the statement that I shot somebody or shot at or shot somebody or shot, period. So then he's denying that he even told Agent Morceau that he had shot his AK-47. And when Detective Ainsa presses him and says, did you shoot? George Kelly admits, yes, he shot. And then he claims that he shot over their heads. And when Detective Ainsa asks him, how far were they when you shot him? George Kelly says 150 yards. Well, we know where Gabriel's body was discovered. 115 yards from the back of the Kelly residence. And why did you shoot at them when they were running away from you? Detective Ainsa asks. And Kelly says, because when you're out there in that situation and, and you have people that, that, they weren't running away from me, they were just running. And you said earlier that they were running away. They were running across, hand moves from, again, his hands moving from left to right, across the wash. And then he clarifies that they were running 100 to 150 yards away again. And then he says, now he says they're armed. And the detective then asks him, when they were running with the rifle, did they ever point their rifle at you? Up until this point, George Allen Kelly has never said a peep about these individuals pointing a gun at him. And we know based on what he told Agent Morcell earlier that they were way too far away for him to see if they had any handguns or had any kind of weapons. And what Kelly says at this point is he says, if a guy's running and, and, and he turns, he's going to turn and he's going to point it at you. Just in, a, just in a mode of turning, he's going to point it at you. So yes, they turned the rifle and pointed it towards me. And again, that's with the knowledge that we already have, that he already told Agent Morceau that they were too far away for him to tell if they had weapons. So what's important about the statement that Kelly made to, Agent, or to Detective Ainsa? He didn't admit he shot his AK-47 until 30 minutes into the, into the interview, and that's because he had something to hide. He knew he'd kill Gabriel. He didn't say anyone pointed a gun at him until Di Detective Ainsa asked him about it, and he didn't say he was in fear for his life until Detective Ainsa suggested it to him. Now, after this interview with George Kelly, Late into the evening of January 30th of 2023 and early into the morning of January 31st of 2023, detectives Ainsa and other members of his team worked to serve a series of search warrants. They served some search warrants on the house. Um, they served some search warrants on the vehicles and the surrounding outbuildings. And you'll hear that during that series of search warrants, um, they recovered the AK-47 that we showed you in the picture that was used in this incident. I'm they still here, asked guys. for assistance Sorry, I covered from our small department, so we asked for assistance not just from the Department of Public Safety, but also for, from ATF. They have a, a dog that can sniff for explosives and can find uh, spent casings. And so we utilized their canine. Uh, Bullshit, to look for the it casings. can't. And in this case, we're talking a very high power. 100% you can object. 100% you can object. Rifle that, um, a high-powered rifle versus a low-powered rifle. I don't know which rifles are low-powered, but okay. 
Maybe everything but a 22, but a 22 is still high-powered. It's enough to kill you. Yes, you could, oppo- you could object during openings. Um, you better have a really good fucking reason, and I would object at this point. Um, this guy didn't tell it himself they wouldn't have found the bodies anytime soon. Yep. So... Yes, that's this is an issue for this guy. A hundred yards in the dark. Yeah. So, um, did I come out on the bridge stuff? I mean, it fell down. There isn't a whole lot to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't like. I'm not able to come in it like Jeff can. Uh, you know, accidents happen. It just happens with boats when a freighter runs into something. It's a lot more dangerous. So. Yeah, should not have talked, but here we are. Oh, gosh, yeah. Went through, through and through the body and into the desert. That projectile could be up to a mile away. That projectile was not covered, recovered by the ATF canine, and it was not recovered even based on detectives' efforts with a metal detector. The officers did recover nine fresh AK-47 casings near the back patio of George Kelly's residence. And the first one was actually discovered by the canine. Um, and I'll show you that photograph in a minute. The other eight casings were de- discovered by um, Detective Joe Bontang, who's now Sergeant Joe Bontang. He found those um, looking during the daylight uh, the following morning. And with him, he also had another detector, I believe. But again, because of the terrain and the type of weapon used, the projectile was not recovered in this case. So we talked a little bit about the weapon earlier, the AK-47, and we talked about the bullets or the rounds, but I've been using a phrase that I didn't explain to you, and that is a spent casing. So the bullet or the or the um, round has several parts to it. It has the projectile, that's the piece of metal that's on the top that you can see that's shiny um, on the on the bullet that's in this picture. And then on the bottom is the dark, darker part, and that part's called the casing. And inside the casing are the explosives that cause the projectile to um, spew out at the top of the, of the round. And so what's left over and what ejects from the weapon is called the spent casing. That's just that metal piece that's left over that the explosives are now out of and the projectile is not out of. So nine casings were recovered um, around the area of George Kelly's back patio. And on the right in these pictures, that you're right, yes, is the spent casings. On the left, you can see the see the rounds or the, or the bolts. Now, during that search warrant, I indicated that um, detectives found the semi-automatic assault rifle, the AK-47. It was in George Kelly's bedroom, and it was behind the door, and it had a sweater over it. Um, George Kelly told the detectives that he always keeps that weapon by his back patio door. It was not there that day when detectives came. And in fact, what you'll hear is that um, it was really late when detectives were there. They took that photograph on the left the first time they were there, and they left the AK-47 behind. They had to come, during their second search warrant, they came back and recovered the AK-47. Um, but that is the AK-47. It was in the same spot when they came back, and they did recover it during the second search warrant. This is the ATF canine that found the first um, casing in this case. And you can see the the tent, the evidence tent, is where that first casing was located. The next day, um, you can see detectives have located the other eight casings in this case. And just to give you an idea of where those casings are located, this is just a still shot of that aerial drone footage we looked at. And you can see the yellow circle is where the eight casings were discovered by the detective. And the one in blue is the one casing that was dis- discovered by the canine. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. It's uh, almost noon. Let's break for the lunch hour. I don't have any additional information about the water situation. It's not like court administrator coming in here. But uh, I doubt it's fixed yet. We're going to break for lunch. We're back in the jury room at 1.30. We'll find out what the water situation is and decide to go from there. But if, so if, if they haven't fixed it and are not able to fix it shortly after there, we'll probably just be assessed for the day. But let's uh, be optimistic about that, and I'll see you back in the jury room. We'll see you back in court. Please be in the jury room at 8.30. Please remember the admonition of the court. That applies to the break at all times. All right. All right, guys, it's another break. Um, 
this is their lunch break. And now, look, we get to time travel like a boss. Over an hour and a half. I mean, these West Coast... These West Coast dudes, man, they go on, they go on breaks, on breaks, on breaks. You know, we come back and they're still hanging out, still hanging out. Almost like almost an hour and forty five minutes. It's crazy. And the prosecutor's still going, and that should tell you something. When you're the prosecutor, and your closing argument or your opening argument is that long, you know this is just absolutely garbage. You need to have been shown to have deep ties to the farms. Thank you. This is just absolutely garbage. This is way too damn long to prove your point. If this was a stipulate to already, what type of objection could you raise? I would object and say, Your Honor, the part opening arguments and opening statements are meant to be a summary or a preview of what's going on. She's literally trying to prove her entire case by eliciting statement after statement after statement after statement on the record right now in front of the jury without any attempt to cross-examine them and i would argue that that's this is not our proper opening um i'm surprised the judge isn't stopping her and saying like you got to trim this down because a lot of judges would so yes fresh casings yes so um, there's a couple of guys, you've asked a bunch of questions here and we're going to get to these in a second. Um, actually, you know, we might answer them right now. So she looks like a wine mom at a boring karaoke. Yes. She's an Arizona woman. So this is standard practice. Bill says, can they claim that he's elderly, confused and scared? Yeah, but that's probably not going to be the best strategy. Then Hotcher says, well, this shooting seems pretty stupid. I mean, yes, if it was, if it was a lot more clear cut, this wouldn't have been an issue. So what are those ones? This is one of these ones where I told you guys, you, you've got like the really good side, the really bad side. And then you've got this gray in the middle and he's in the gray. Um, Winter Soldier says, no, no recording of this. Why does she get to narrate? Well, it's because they're opening arguments. But yes, this should be have stomped on a long time ago. Yes, the, the, the police are probably wishing this guy didn't fucking talk to him. If he hadn't fucking talked, this wouldn't have ever happened. Um, where is Clyde? What horrible things did I do to him today? Says Brandon Lesko. I don't know. Hey, Clyde. <whistles> Clyde. Click, 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 click. Hey, Bubba. Come here. Hey. Okay, you heard him click, clack, so I don't know where he's. Clyde, come here. Hey, up. Hi, buddy. Mm. And you know, thank you for the super chat, by the way, Brandon. And you no longer smell like pee because you got a bath. Mm, you smell like dog cleaner. You smell so nice now. You don't smell like pee no more. Mm. I'll hold you, buddy. We'll talk more in the chat. We'll talk to the chattels for a minute. I've got him. Let's go. Can't hurt you, Clyde. I've got you. I shall protect you. He's like, don't let the Brandon man get me. I won't let him do that to you, Bubba. I love you so much, Clyde. Mwah. It's almost your gotcha day. Ten more days. We'll have gotcha, ya. Hmm. I'll protect you from the evil Brandon man. Oh, God, your breast smells bad, buddy. What did you eat? Until he's saying, um, if it's legal to shoot on within your own property, what stops someone from shooting on their property for target purposes at all times? Oh. He's sweeping. Why, <laughs> buddy? Are you okay? Um, what stops someone from shooting on the property for target person at all times? Trespassing would make you the guilty party. No. Well, Tilly, you, you may have the right to discharge weapons on your property, but you do have a duty to make sure you're not injuring people. So you may be trespassing on my property, and for, like, civil purposes, yes, you've assumed the risk of getting shot. But legally, like, in a criminal sense, I can't just start throwing copper on my property willy-nilly, Tilly. <laughs> um, you can't just start throwing copper on your property and be like, well, they weren't supposed to be there. It's like, 
you aren't supposed to shoot people. You're supposed to exercise care when you're using a firearm. So, um, no, you got to be careful when you fire your shots. Every shot you make, you own. Quick says 199. Um, thank you. Saying thank you. This opening seems stretched for sure. This is this is garbage. I would not have. I would have objected long ago. But maybe the other attorney has. Maybe they haven't. That that's a style thing too. A lot of attorneys are like, "Ooh, I don't like getting in." interfering in the openings that's that's kind of poor form unless you got a good reason i think there's a good reason here there's a lot of judges though i've been in front of where they would have told counselor let's let's fucking wrap this up a while ago so i'm telling you old people are dealing with freaking trespassers at night and rightfully get scared yeah especially on the border i i don't disagree with you i don't disagree with you Chunk, did he, did he diddle the cat in the fiddle? Um, Saul is saying, um, what is this? Uh, Saul uh, Vlasitov saying, what is this dog? This dog is multiple things. He is mainly a Shih Tzu. He's also a Chow Chow. He's also part Lhasa Apso. But he's like 30% Shih Tzu. And then he's like a little bit of Terrier in the mix. And then 2% Ashkenazi Jew. We did the Embark thing, and that's what we found out his DNA is. Oh, that was a big yawn. But yes, he's got the... He's got the Shih Tzu underbite. But he's got some of these other... He's got the chow, He's got a lot of Chow Chow characteristics, too. Souffle says the gotcha day. Yeah, that's the day we picked him up from the shelter. We got cleared to pick him up was on the 10th. So five days after we saw him, we got him. We were cleared. Yes, he's not very... He just flops over, so... Yeah. But remember, guys, when it comes to these rifles, guess what they're going to say? Your, your high-powered semi-automatic rifle... Like, remember, they're going to make it look bad. So... Are you sure it's not Russell Greer's long lost dog cousin? No. All right, guys. So here we go. Let's let's finish this up. See what the defense has to say. Proceed. Continue with your open So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we were talking about this visual that is up on the screen now. And the reason why I was showing you this visual again is I wanted to tell you that you're going to hear some testimony from two officers from the Department of Public Safety from the aerial photographs. And they also did uh, something called a Leica scan of the area. And a Leica scan is a more detailed um, type of analysis where they take really detailed measurements so that they can do measurements um, of the scene that are accurate and to scale. And so uh, this is the drone photo with the measurements, uh, but you'll also hear from a sergeant captain who did the, the light scan for us as well. And then again, as I indicated, uh, Trooper Reyna is going to testify about the drone uh, footage. The next officers you're going to hear from um, are an FBI agent who assisted the detectives in downloading Mr. Kelly's cell phone. Um, our detectives aren't up to speed, or weren't at the time up to speed on some new cell phone data called Cellbrite. And that data, that software is what we use to download people's cell phones. So we can look at their text messages, their photos, and, the, and their phone calls, those sorts of things. And so the FBI, you'll hear from the FBI agent who assisted with that download. And you'll hear from Detective Mario Barba. He's actually the tall detective that was in that photograph you saw. Um, so you'll meet him when he comes in to talk about those uh, cell phone downloads. And he did something called a physical download of the defendant's cell phone. You'll learn that the defendant's cell phone was kind of an older model phone, so the Cellbrite um, software wasn't actually able to open it because the software was old on it. And so what we actually had to do was go through the phone and physically examine and take photographs of things as opposed to the normal download we would do. That is so funny. He had such an old boomer phone. They sell His phone's so old, Cellbrite doesn't work on it. I don't think I've ever heard of that before. 
his phone is so old. Cellbrite's like, yeah, this is like trying to analyze a brick. Um, yeah, his jitterbug was not. They couldn't break it. They couldn't bust open his jitterbug. <laughs> hmm. That that is interesting. Cellbrite cannot bust a jitterbug. That's interesting. Yes, Lamau. Lamau, Clyde, how you doing, buddy? You, you, you're looking out that way. Do you want your mama? I'll let you down, buddy. That's Clyde, everybody. Give him a round of applause. Go oh, boy. Was the phone strapped on the flashlight, too? Maybe. So... The big extra buttons and less feds on your phone, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's keep going, guys. And you're going to hear about some of those text messages. And they really give you some insight into what was happening with George Kelly in the weeks leading up to the homicide. And you'll see this is just sort of a flavor of those text messages. And you'll see all of them as we um, go through the, the testimony from Detective Barba and Agent um, Douglas. And this is kind of the flavor. Uh, he's sending texts to his friend a couple of weeks before the homicide saying, overrun with drug cartel, AK getting a lot of work. Pick of drug runner carpet tracks, and one of the CBP agents will explain what carpet tracks are to you. Those are essentially booties that migrants use to try to cover their um, sign as they're walking through the desert. That they call them carpet. Um, Your Honor, can we have a conference briefly? You guys, you guys don't do it. I just pop the left ear off, and it's not as loud. So, for some reason, the right ear doesn't pick everything up too well. So, um. I'm hoping she's saying like, "Judge, this is bullshit. Can we keep it going? Can we get a move on here?" Sorry for the interruption. As I was saying, uh, the first text message talks about Mr. Kelly on January 13th of 2023, which is just two weeks before the homicide, is texting his friend Gary Miller, overrun with drug cartel, aka getting a lot of work. And then a second one, pick of drug runner carpet tracks, 33 dealt with this week, aka hot, aka hot. And then you'll see there's actually a text to his son on that same day. His son is not Kelly. And that text message says, 33 drug runners this week. Pick attached is a drug runner carpet movies. AK-47 hot. Want to be backup? And his son responds with a note and a, and a hand emoji with the thumb down. And he says, be careful. And Mr. Kelly responds, careful is not an option. It's either fight or run, and I'm too old to run. Mom is L&L &L or locked and loaded also. So that's uh, some of the text messages that you're going to see. And you're also going to hear from a number of expert witnesses in this case. One of the expert witnesses you're going to hear from is Aaron Brunel, and he's a weapons specialist. He's going to come in and talk to you about the functionality of the AK-47, that it actually works. He's going to tell you that the AK-47 matches to the casings that were located on the defendant's patio that we showed you, uh, those nine casings earlier in the photographs. He's going to talk about something called an ejection pattern for the AK-47. He's going to talk to you about, and, and what that means essentially is, when the spent casings eject from the AK-47, what pattern did they normally land in? That's called an ejection pattern. So he'll talk to you about what the ejection pattern for this weapon is, and you'll learn um, why that's important from the experts as they testify. He's also going to talk to you about an examination of the victim's clothing. He's going to tell you that he didn't see any soot or any spibbling. And what that tells you is that this was not a close-up shot. We know it wasn't a close-up shot. We know Mr. Kelly shot from his back patio. But this just confirms that determination.
Next, you're going to hear from two other experts from the Arizona Department of Public Safety Crime Lab, and they're both forensic scientists as well. And these two forensic scientists did some work essentially just to check the boxes to make sure. Um, we don't expect that on a casing we're going to find any DNA or any fingerprints. And that's because of how hot it is inside the weapon. Um, that just burns off any DNA or any fingerprints. But we went ahead and checked those casings anyway for fingerprints and DNA. And we didn't find any fingerprints on the casings. And we also preserved whatever was on, was on the casings as far as DNA goes. But again, that was really just a checkbox, um, not really expecting to find anything. The next outside expert witness you're going to hear from is a man named Rick Wyant. And Rick Wyant is also a forensic scientist. He has his own consulting company, but he also works for a state crime lab in another state. <coughs> Mr. Wyant is the shooting reconstructionist in this case. He's the ballistics expert. And he's going to talk to you about the shooting reconstruction and also about something called bullet wobble. Um, you'll see that he'll talk to you a little bit about how the shape of the entry wound is for the gunshot wound and that there was a little bit of wobble on that. And he'll explain to you what that could be caused by hitting a little branch or, or something like that along the way, um, on the way that it hit um, Gabriel. The next expert witness you're going to hear from is Tara Telsell. And Ms. Telsell is a scientist um, from RJ Lee Labs. And you'll hear that this, um, this information that she's going to try to provide you comes from trace examination of the victim's clothing. And this was, again, just to determine um, if this is a close-up shot or a far shot. And she'll explain to you what her findings are when she's here. You're also going to hear from the medical examiner, from the Pima County Medical Examiner's Office, that did the exam of the forensic autopsy of Gabriel in this case. And she's going to describe for you um, the injuries to the uh, to the victim in this case. And I'm going to show you a couple of photographs from the autopsy that show you the entry and the exit wound. This is the entry wound on Gabriel's back. And Dr. Uh, Tim will explain to you the, the, all of the dimensions of the wound and what that means. And this is the exit wound on Gabriel's chest. And she'll explain to you again what all of those, um, what all of the measurements mean and how she knows which is entry and which is exit wound. The other thing she's going to tell you is that she didn't find any stippling or any soot around the entry wound in this case. And again, that's an indication that this is not a close-up shot. And then finally, she's going to talk to you about the path of the projectile in this case. She's going to talk to you about how the projectile entered through these three ribs back here and essentially blew out those ribs and traveled through the ribs, through the, um, through the right lung, through the pericardial sac, through the ascending aorta, through the sternum, through the parasternal anterior left second rib, and then out. And she's going to give you all the details uh, about that injury and what that means in terms of how, how long he might have lived what that means with respect to how he could have responded um, immediately following the shooting. She'll tell you all about those details. But the one thing that I want to make sure I leave you with is that when we're talking about the evidence in this case, I want to remind you of the words of George Allen Kelly. And I want to remind you that Mr. Kelly told you, I'm not, I'm not admitting to anything I've done, but all those things tend to add up. And they do add up in this case. And they add up the second degree murder and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. All of the items of evidence point toward that. We've got the ballistics and the bullet trajectory, the medical examiner's testimony, the fact that Gabriel's body is 115 yards away from the Kelly residence, the fact that Kelly says that the individuals he saw were 100 to 150 yards away from his residence, the location of, location of the casing, the ejection pattern that you'll learn about from the experts. The information about the horse that you heard from, hear from Daniel, and that is corroborated by the defendant's conversation with Jeremy Morsell. The fact that no one heard that alleged first shot except George Allen Kelly. There's no soot or stippling on the wounds, indicating this is not a close-up shot. 
and Kelly admits that he shot his AK-47, and we have matched the casings by his patio to his AK-47. And Kelly admits that these people weren't coming toward his house, they weren't approaching him, they weren't any kind of threat to him. They were going parallel to his residence. And I just mentioned the AK-47 matched the casings. And then finally, you'll have the testimony of Daniel, who will tell you what he observed that day. And all of those things will lead you to find that the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of these charges. We'll leave you, the state's evidence will leave you firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt in this case. The defendant has, has told the officer that he was conscious of the consequences of his actions and he would take responsibility for those actions. We're going to ask you to hold him to that and to find him guilty at the end of this trial of these two charges. Second degree murder with a no. death of Gabriel Corn with Mayo and aggravated assault Remaining. with a deadly weapon for Daniel Ramirez. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hudley. Does the defense wish to give an open statement? Yes. Whenever you're ready. Mm -hmm. Guys, this is in Santa Cruz County, Arizona. If this is federal court, we wouldn't see any of this. So um, this is uh, federal court or state court. And no, I was reading some stuff I got uh, from somebody stuck in a jail. Um, they wrote me some things and I was taking a look at that. So so not impressive. That's a snoozer of an argument. I'm not going to lie, guys. Also, I, I just, when women wear their blazers, they wear, like, the blazer thing, but it looks like they're not wearing anything underneath it. It just doesn't look good to me. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Because you're working. Okay. If I start to get too quiet or if these stop working, just wave at me because I want to make sure we... Already, she's got far more ener energy, and I'm already a little more in tune to her than the prosecutor's like, well, hello. You can hear what's being said here. You guys haven't heard much from me yet. My name's Brenna Larkin. I represent George Allen Kelly. And that's who I want to talk to you about today. Because the state talks a lot here today about what they say happened on January 30th of last year. And I want to talk about everything that led up to that incident so that you have an idea and you can put that incident into context when you're actually hearing the evidence. And the evidence is going to describe some of Mr. Kelly's background. The evidence is going to show that Mr. Kelly is born in the Carolinas. He grew up always in rural areas. He's always hunting, he's always fishing, mostly fishing. That's his life ever since he's a young boy. And he goes to college, graduates college, he marries Wanda, who's his high school sweetheart, and they start a life together, he and his wife. Mr. Kelly works with fish and wildlife for a very long time. It allows him to be outdoors, it allows him to be in nature, it allows him to be close to the things that he loves and doing the things that he loves. Eventually, he and Wanda decide to move to Montana because he takes a job out there and the trout fishing in Montana is the best in the whole world. That's why he wants to be there. He winds up working for Fish and Wildlife on um, an Indian reservation and working with the tribe that's out there. Eventually, the state takes over the tribal land and his job no longer exists for him out in Montana. He's offered positions in different places, but all of those positions are desk jobs in a city which to him is just not something that he can do. So he and his wife decide to stay in Montana, and they open up a lodge. They open up an Orvis Lodge that involves taking people on guided trips to go fishing, to go hunting, and they operate that as a family for many, many years. He and his wife have two sons. The sons help work on the lodge as well, and they're all very happy. Wanda's a school teacher. Mr. Kelly really, really likes living in Montana. Wanda thinks it's too cold. And Wanda has always wanted to move to Arizona, ever since she was a child. She saw pictures of Arizona in a book, and that was her dream. So she and Alan, and I'm going to call him Alan, he's George Alan Kelly, but Mr. Kelly is his father, and nobody calls him George. So if I call him Alan, that's who I'm talking about. Alan and Wanda made a deal. Alan said to Wanda, if you come with me to Montana, and if you live here for as long as we can for our career, for my career, and if you support me, then after a certain amount of time, I'll move with you to Arizona. And eventually, Wanda holds him to that, and they come to Arizona. They first go through Flagstaff, but Wanda sees snow, so they have to keep going further south. And eventually, they wind up down in southern Arizona. 
they don't purchase the property where he's at right away. They have some other ranching property nearby that's in a different location at first. But eventually they purchase the property where this incident took place. And they purchased that property many, many years ago. I believe 20, 20 or so years ago is when they actually purchased that property. So he and Wanda have been out there for a very long time. They had to build their house there. They had to fence the, the whole property in order to put cattle on the property to run their ranch. And they've been living there ever since. It's the dream home, and that's where they want to be. Alan, not being from here and never living close to the border, never really knew anything about illegal immigration. It just wasn't something that was in his mind when he came down here. He had his first experience, his first encounter ever with illegal immigrants when he was putting up fence posts trying to fence his property. He and a couple of folks were helping him build the fence and he describes stumbling upon a group of people. And he didn't really know what was happening. He'd never encountered something like this before. But he saw this group of people. The group of people looked scared when he and his workers ran into them. And he just remembers in the moment thinking, this is, this is strange and they look scared. So he said, está bien. Just, but he has limited Spanish now, but he knows how to tell them it's okay. And his first impression, he, he was confused, and the folks who were helping him build his fence tell him, oh, those are, those are illegal aliens. That's, that's what you just saw. And so he had to start learning about what that was. That was never something that he'd ever encountered before. And he describes that first encounter as very heartbreaking to him. He, he saw people, and he saw families, and he saw that people were hurting. He saw that people were desperate, and he saw that people were scared. And that was the first, the first impression he had of illegals on his property. And he's building the fence. He hasn't put any wire up yet. He learns that it's likely there will be more such people who are coming across his property. And he thinks, well, I mean, that's not, that's not great, but what can I do about it? And so he purchases some smooth wire for the fence. The top strands of the, on the fence are barbed wire. The bottom wire is smooth wire because he knows if people are going to be coming through, he at least doesn't want anybody to get hurt. Over the smooth years, wire for and the again, many years he's on this property, over the years he sees some more things start to transpire. He doesn't see people close up very frequently. He sees people from a distance if he sees people at all. He sees people who are family groups, and he knows they're family groups because they're people who are men, who are women, who are children, all sort of traveling together. In the early days, everybody's wearing ordinary clothing, so no different from the clothing you might see if you just walk around outside today. And in the early days, he doesn't encounter very many problems, and he doesn't feel afraid. He feels these people are actually more afraid of me than I am of them, because they run when they see me, they get scared. He starts to pick up on as he goes out, and he goes out every day on his ranch. He's a cattle rancher, he's out there every day. He sees trails, he sees tracks, he sees different signs throughout the day, every day, of people coming through his property. He sees what he describes as campsites, meaning a place where people stay for longer, perhaps past the night. In these areas, he finds water bottles, he finds clothing, he finds discarded food items, all sorts of things just to tell him, even though I didn't see people, I know people were here because here's signs of people being here. And he learns over the years where these sites are. And over the years, as he's out on his property, if he happens to have a water bottle with him, he'll leave a water bottle at one of those sites because he doesn't want anything bad to happen to anybody on his property. He's a compassionate man, and he, he doesn't want people on his property, but he understands that people have their own lives and they're trying to do something out of desperation. He starts to communicate with Border Patrol. These ranches that are on the border have a program called a Ranch Liaison Program. And that program involves a person, the Ranch Liaison, whose job it is to connect with these ranchers on the border, establish rapport, establish communication with them, in order that this rancher who's out here in this vast area can have somebody to access, to talk to, whenever something, something happens or whenever something is seen. And so over the years, Mr. Kelly, becomes familiar with a number of ranch liaisons who cycle through that position. He reports things to the ranch liaison that he sees. He's told by the ranch liaison, you know, if it's a criminal issue, you can call 911. If it's a border issue, so if there's an issue with any kind of illegal immigration on your property, call the ranch liaison. The ranch liaison also sends information to the ranchers. 
So if the ranch liaison is aware that there's a big group of people in a certain area, if it's near a ranch, the ranch liaison will communicate that to the rancher to say, here's a heads up, I'm letting you guys know there's this number of people in your area, things of that nature. If Mr. Kelly were to ever see a helicopter circling his property, for example, and he doesn't know what's going on, he calls the ranch liaison because that's whose helicopter that is and they're going to know what's going on and they'll inform him of what's going on. So Mr. Kelly establishes this relationship and this rapport with Border Patrol over the years. He learns over the years that the response time to his property is not necessarily very fast. So if he calls somebody, he might not get somebody out there for 15 minutes or something like that. And by that time, whoever was there is gone. Whatever he saw is no longer there. That's just the nature of reality on the ground for Mr. Kelly out there. This is all pretty fine and dandy for many, many years. And then things start to change. Mr. Kelly starts to see different things. He's not seeing as many family groups anymore. Mr. <laughs> Kelly starts to see individuals carrying backpacks. Men, always men, carrying backpacks and going along the fence lines. He knows that these are individuals engaged in illegal activity because when they see him, they run away. Still, people run away from him. And then things change. And things change in a very dangerous and a very frightening way for Mr. Kelly and for his wife. Mr. Kelly starts to see larger groups, and he starts to see larger groups of all men carrying large backpacks. At first, he doesn't see any weapons, but he's seeing a difference. These aren't the same family groups that he saw when he first started living on this property. This is something else. He talks to the ranch liaison, they communicate with him. He learns that there's drugs in this area. There's human trafficking in this area. There are other things going on besides family groups coming through here. The ranch liaison communicate with Mr. Kelly eventually, and they never used to say this before, but they start to say, there's a group in your area, be careful. Don't try to stay, if while there's this group in this area, don't go out. They communicate different messages like that. It used to be you run into a group of people, it's no problem. People might be scared, they might be afraid that you'll report them or something, but this is different, something has changed. Now there's more fear coming from Mr. Kelly and from his wife. He doesn't know anymore who he's going to run into when he's out on his property. And eventually, over the years, he has a couple encounters where he starts to see weapons. He sees, again, these groups of men carrying backpacks, and this time he'll see a rifle, maybe two rifles. Things start to get much more dangerous. This isn't what it used to be. <coughs> on at least one occasion, somebody takes a shot at Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly gets fired at on at least one occasion. On that particular occasion, Mr. Kelly didn't have a rifle with him. He had his pistol with him, which he carried with him a lot, but he didn't have a rifle. And the person who fired the shot was so far away, his pistol would be ineffective. So Mr. Kelly dropped down into the grass, and he waited, and he hoped. He hoped that nothing further was going to happen. And he stayed there for about 15 minutes before he was able to gather himself and come in. Over the years, he's reported a number of incident incidents to law enforcement involving either seeing people or hearing shots, being approached by people, those sorts of things. Over the years, he's made a number of reports. And typically, the report gets investigated, law enforcement comes, they take Mr. Kelly's statement, they can't find anyone because they, it took too long for them to get out there, people are gone anyway, and nothing happens other than he's able to report it. But because of this heightened level of danger and this heightened level of risk, Mr. Kelly starts to feel unsafe on his property. And he knows when he goes out, he needs to be armed to protect himself. He also chooses to be armed as a deterrent. He hopes that if people see him, and if they see that he's carrying a rifle, they will leave him alone. And then nothing has to happen. No encounters have to take place. Mr. Kelly does not wish for a violent encounter. This is some of the background coming from Mr. Kelly and his wife. You'll hear them talk about these types of things and what's going on on their property. You're also going to hear from a number of different Border Patrol agents who have experience out in that property and in that general area who know the area. Border Patrol knows what's going on out there. They know which types of people are out there and what they're doing. 
And this is an area, Mr. Kelly's Ranch is about one and a half miles north as the crow flies from the border wall. And you're going to hear something called the end of the wall. You're going to hear that described by witnesses in this case. One and a half miles south of Mr. Kelly's property is the international border between the United States and Mexico. And there's a wall out there, and then it ends. There's a, a very tall wall. It's metal. It has razor wire on top. It's, it's pretty big and pretty imposing, pretty difficult to climb over or get around. And then it just stops. That wall just stops. And after that, there's a, a little barbed wire fence, and there's what are called Normandy barriers, which are sort of metal crisscross things that will stop a vehicle, but they won't stop people. And so you're going to hear that the walls can be effective in moving traffic. So traffic that might come through closer to Nogales now has to move further out and come across here where the wall ends, which is right near Mr. Kelly's property. And so this is a corridor. Mr. Kelly's property is in a corridor of illegal traffic. And you'll hear that that illegal traffic includes human smuggling and drug smuggling. You'll hear that there are different sort of jobs, I suppose, or positions involved with this illegal traffic. There are scouts and their guides, who are people who are working to facilitate both human and drug smuggling. So a scout is a person who's going to typically be stationed at a high point on a mountain with binoculars, who can survey an area visually. They're typically wearing camouflage, typically trying to conceal themselves, and they have a radio with them so that they can see where a border patrol is, they can see where a group is that might be going through for whatever reason, they can see where the pickup point is, and they can relay this information on the radio to the bad guys on the ground who are trafficking the people or trafficking the drugs through the area. You're also going to hear that out there there are guides, or coyotes. But the coyotes are the guides, and those are the folks who are guiding groups of people through this area. A guide will have a radio, a guide might be listening on the radio to a scout or to somebody else, a guide will be responsible for bringing either people or people who are carrying drugs or just people to a certain location. You're also going to hear that there are other groups out there that are called either rip crews or bandits depending on which term you prefer. But there are groups of people out there who try to take advantage of the illegal traffic that's going on. These are people who might confront somebody who's carrying drugs with weapons, steal the drugs from the person who's carrying drugs. These are people who might confront these migrant groups and rob them because this type of crime doesn't really get reported. If somebody's a migrant and they're in here, they're very vulnerable. If the bad guys go and rob them, it's not frequent that that's reported. So this is just a general character of the type of crime that's happening in this rural area that's out east of Nogales, very near Mr. Kelly's property. You're going to hear that this traffic is controlled. This is not haphazard criminal activity. This is organized criminal activity. And there's a hierarchy of organization involved in these trafficking enterprises. And you're going to hear that everything is controlled, including illegal migration, by these higher up drug trafficking organizations. You're going to hear that nothing goes through there. No drugs, no people, no nothing, no asylum seekers, no nothing, unless there's some sort of knowledge or approval from these organizations who control this territory. As such, you're going to hear that Sometimes these organizations will retaliate against a guide, let's say, for various reasons. Perhaps this guy lost a load of drugs that he was supposed to deliver. <coughs> Perhaps this guy stole a load of drugs that he was supposed to deliver. Perhaps this guy talked to the wrong person, gave information to the wrong person. Perhaps this guy smuggled a little bit extra without permission. Smuggling extra without permission is not allowed either. This is all happening in the area of Mr. Kelly's ranch. This ranch is isolated, it's secluded. There are border patrol cameras that are out there looking at the national forest and looking at some of the properties out there. These cameras are not regularly pointed on Mr. Kelly's property. 
And the smugglers who use this area, they know how to avoid the cameras, they know how to go under the radar. Smugglers in that area are largely successful at what they do. Smugglers in that area are not keen to have a lot of extra police presence in that area. They've got a good operation going through there. They don't want people coming in there and messing that up for them. Mr. Kelly's property is a good corridor because it's right there north of where the wall ends, which is where people are coming through. And it's also right on the way to a road called Duquesne Road, which goes east to west out there. And that's a good pickup location. People who move drugs and people drop things off into a vehicle, the vehicle takes them somewhere else. Duquesne Road is known for a lot of that sort of traffic. That's the knowledge that Border Patrol brings to the table about this area and about what's going on out there. Mr. Kelly and Wanda bring knowledge about this area as well, based on what they've seen and based on what they've done over the years. We mentioned too that Mr. Kelly and Wanda both feel less safe over, over time as they're on this property, as they're receiving this information, and as they're looking at more evidence. And on those campsites that I mentioned where they're finding water bottles, they're finding clothing, they're finding things like that, they're noticing differences in clothing too. They're noticing that there's a lot more camouflage that they're seeing now that they didn't used to see. They're noticing that these water bottles that people are carrying are painted black. So a plastic water bottle that's painted black to avoid reflecting off of anything, to further avoid detection. And they find carpet shoes all over their property on a pretty regular basis. And carpet shoes are a, it's, it's a cut out piece of carpet that you put on the bottom of your shoe and then there's camouflage and Velcro that's sewn into the carpet to attach the carpet to your shoe. And they learned that these are tools that are also used by smugglers to try to avoid being tracked because Border Patrol tracks people and carpet shoes. Carpet shoes aren't a very effective way to hide yourself. It's very much a effective way to do it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a nightmare down on the border. It's rough as hell. So, yeah. But yes, wearing carpet on the bottom of your shoes, you know, with carpet flaps, it stirs up the dust it's kind of like how the Viet Cong would do it they'd use tires doesn't make any sense it throws off trackers so yes all that is all those are effective counter tracking techniques hopefully for the smugglers tend to avoid that carpet shoes are typically discarded when a person gets picked up because they don't want to be found with carpet shoes later because that looks pretty suspicious and so you'll find groups of carpet shoes just dropped in various locations on Mr. Kelly's property at various times. And when Mr. Kelly runs into this, he knows there was a group out here of somebody doing something and they got picked up from here. Sometimes that's on his property, sometimes it's on roads near his property. It, it's a common occurrence for Mr. Kelly and his wife out there to have to deal with that. Things get very serious one, one, um, one time when Mr. Kelly is no longer on the property. Mr. Kelly leaves because he and his wife have some property up in the White Mountains. Um, it, has, it has to be prepared before they can stay in it. A lot of things have to be dewinterized and stuff like that. But they like to go to the White Mountains in the summertime. Mr. Kelly's away at the White Mountains once when he gets a call from Wanda. And she says that something happened. She doesn't know what, but something happened. There's helicopters everywhere. She doesn't know what's going on. Mr. Kelly and Wanda eventually hear that somebody found a dead body near Mr. Kelly's property. And this is the body of a woman who's been discovered, he believes, in a car. He hears this little secondhand, thirdhand knowledge, so he's not sure exactly what happened out there. But he's very concerned. And one of the neighbors tells him that this woman was possibly murdered. And he stops what he's doing, he returns, and he goes back because he doesn't want Wanda to be by herself when all of this is going on. This is the environment that he finds himself in, and this is what he and Wanda are dealing with on a regular basis. They used to feel safe on their property. They don't feel safe on their property anymore. And there's a lot of scary things that are happening around them. They've called law enforcement before, and they know that it takes time to get out there. They have a good relationship with law enforcement. Mr. Kelly continues to report things that he sees, including various cuts in his fences. 
because back in the day, when you had family groups going through, they would go under the fences by the smooth wire. Not anymore. Now his fences get cut pretty regularly. And his cows will get out, and he has to walk his fences to make sure that he can repair them and things like that. So he's scared every day on his property. And he needs to arm himself every day on his property to try to deter this, to try to protect himself. It's in this context that Mr. Kelly sends text messages that the state put on your screens in front of you during their opening statement. You're going to hear about some of Mr. Kelly's text messages, and the state's going to tell you that this shows that Mr. Kelly is just amping himself up to go do something. He's really getting ready to hurt somebody. He really hates people who are crossing his property, etc. I just want to get out in front of that a little bit and give you folks the context so that when you read those messages, you can understand what Mr. Kelly is saying. In those messages, Mr. Kelly's talking to a friend of his who lives up in the White Mountains. And in those messages, Mr. Kelly is sharing his feelings with his friend. And when men get together to share their feelings, as far as I know, maybe this is, doesn't mean anything, but when they get together to share their feelings, they don't typically say, hey man, I'm really scared on my property. There's a lot going on. I feel this is getting out of my control. I hope and pray that nothing will happen to me or my wife, but I'm really scared. <coughs> Maybe some men do that, but a lot of them don't. <laughs> a lot of them will say things like, hey man, I'm in a war zone over here. You know, give me some support, buddy. Or hey, guess what happened the other day? I was out there and they tell stories. They exaggerate, they go over the top, to the point of even lying and making things up. They insult each other, they use self-deprecating humor, they talk about how they're too old to run away, ah, I can't shoot straight, gotta shoot a lot of rounds, I'm too old. That's the sort of conversation that we're talking about. We're talking about private conversation between two guys that's crude, that's over-exaggerated, and that can certainly be offensive in some company. What's also never intended to be seen by anybody. This is intended to be private. This is intended to be just a couple of guys who know each other, who have known each other for a very long time, who are trying to blow off steam because of the impossible situation that Mr. Kelly finds himself in. The evidence is not going to show that these messages show that Mr. Kelly is a mean or a violent person or that Mr. Kelly hates anybody. These messages do not take away from Mr. Kelly's compassionate heart. They do illustrate his fear and they illustrate his increasing concern about what's happening. They illustrate his knowledge that he might be encountered with something dangerous. They illustrate his fear of being discovered unarmed on his property. And they illustrate his fear of possibly being confronted by armed people on his property, as he has been in the past. And then, on January 30th of 2023, Mr. Kelly is confronted with this threat. January 30th starts out a day like any other day on Mr. Kelly's ranch. He goes outside, he does his chores, he's got his animals, he's checking on them, and then he goes inside to eat lunch. It's a late lunch, it's around two o'clock, something like that. His wife, Wanda, is in the house and she's playing with the cat when this happens. And Mr. Kelly's making his sandwich and he looks up and that's, he looks up and he sees something out of the windows in front of him. From where he's standing, and the state showed you that picture where they showed here's where the body was, here's the view that he got. Mr. Kelly's not standing on his patio when he looks up. He's standing inside his house and looking out windows. That view that the state showed you in that picture, that's impossible to see from where Mr. Kelly's standing inside of his house. You go outside on the patio, it's extremely difficult to see. Inside in the house, absolutely impossible. There's no way Mr. Kelly saw anything out there at that distance from inside his house. But he does see something from inside his house. He sees at least five people carrying large backpacks and carrying rifles and they're going across his property. Window on the left, window on the right. He sees them going from left to right. He says, Wanda, be quiet. Call Jeremy Morcell. Call the ranch liaison, because he sees these people. That's the person who responds. That's the fastest person who responds to help. Wanda gets her phone, 
She calls the number. Mr. Kelly feels threatened when he sees these people walking across his property like this with those weapons. Mr. Kelly gets the ranch liaison on the phone. He tells the ranch liaison about what he's seeing. And then he hears a shot. He hears a shot fired. A single shot. He thinks it's the sound of a rifle shot. This happens so fast, but this single shot that he hears changes everything in his mind. He knows that something is happening outside. Something violent. Something dangerous. That single shot might not be the last shot fired. That might be the first of many shots that he hears. All of this processes through his mind in less than a second. Just hearing that single shot, suddenly everything is different. Suddenly, this might go very badly. Wanda's with him. She didn't hear the shot. Wanda wears hearing aids, and those were fading. And she doesn't hear noises that are happening outside like that, even when they're working to the best of their abilities. But Mr. Kelly heard that shot, and he knew that he and his wife were in danger. Time in a moment like that is really suspended, and people start acting. There's not a lot of logical thought process. There's action. Some people freeze, some people act. And Mr. Kelly acted. He took action in order to protect himself and to protect his wife. Again, he tells Wanda, Wanda, call Agent Marcel. Wanda calls Agent Marcel. Mr. Kelly quickly says, I might be being shot at. I might be returning fire. I'm returning fire. Goes out. Agent Marcel describes this conversation as very quick. He says Mr. Kelly is excited. He says Mr. Kelly is obviously encountering something, because he obviously is. He's inside his house. He cannot see the location where this body is discovered from there, but he's obviously encountering something. That means there's something happening out there that has nothing to do with the location of this body. There's something else happening. Agent Marcel has now been informed. Now Border Patrol and the Sheriff's Department are hopefully on their way. Mr. Kelly knows this. He knows law enforcement's coming, but he knows how slow their response time is, and he knows that the threat that he's encountering is the threat he's encountering right now. Wanda, stay inside. He tells Wanda to stay inside. Wanda is terrified. She stands in the living room in between the windows. She doesn't even want to look outside. She's frozen. She's scared. Mr. Kelly walks outside. He picks up his rifle while he goes outside. He sees his horse running at about 100, 150 yards away, beyond two fences. His horse is out there, running. His horse is Sonny. Sonny is spooked. Sonny doesn't like gunshots. Sonny heard that single shot, too. And he's running. He picked up on the danger, too. He's an old horse. He doesn't like to run, and he doesn't do it very often. But when he's scared, he runs. Mr. Kelly wanted to just go out onto the patio with his rifle to be visible so that people could see him and they would run away. They wouldn't encounter him. That was his plan. So he walks outside the metal porch door that he goes out. It shuts with a bang. It's a loud bang. The person who's in front of the group who's leaving turns, sees Mr. Kelly and points his rifle at Mr. Kelly. This is another one of those moments, like hearing that single shot. He sees a rifle. A rifle is pointed at him. Mr. Kelly is threatened. There are armed criminals on his property. He's already heard a shot. Maybe another shot is about to be fired, and maybe it's about to be fired at him. He believes that his life is in imminent danger. He knows that Wanda is in the house behind him. He knows her life is also in imminent danger, and he has to stop the threat. He has to stop it from happening. He makes a split-second decision. He doesn't shoot this person. He doesn't use lethal force. Even though he had every right to do so, he doesn't. He raises his rifle at an angle high up so that he knows he's not going to hit anybody, and he fires. He fires until the threat is gone. He fires until these people are on their way out, and he knows that they're leaving. You heard the state talk about how Mr. Kelly's rifle had a 30-round magazine. It can be emptied in a matter of seconds. Mr. Kelly didn't empty his magazine, not even close. Mr. Kelly fired eight, nine shots, and then he stopped. He stopped because the threat stopped. The threat was gone, and he stopped. What he did to protect himself and to protect his wife was effective. These folks run away. Wanda, she's inside the house. She can hear these shots. These shots are coming from close by. She can hear them. She freezes. 
She can't even look out the window. She's so scared that her husband might be out there dead. She doesn't know what happened. She doesn't know how long she stands there, afraid to look out and see what happened. She doesn't want to see his body when she looks out the window. She gets the courage eventually to look out. She doesn't see Alan. She's relieved. She sees him walking on the road towards the barn. He tells her he's okay. He says he's gonna go check on his barn. And he walks in that direction to make sure that his barn is secure. He walks on his road to make sure people are gone and to make sure he and his wife are truly safe. As he does that, he has another phone call with Agent Morcell. He tells Agent Morcell that he saw these folks and Agent Morcell asks him if Mr. Kelly was being shot at or if they were armed. Mr. Kelly says something to the effect of, it's too far away to tell if they are all armed. Something along those lines. Agent Morcell interprets that as Mr. Kelly saying, now he doesn't say anybody is armed. Now he's changed his statement. This misunderstanding between Mr. Kelly and Agent Morcell is later used against Mr. Kelly. Unfortunately, the phone calls that Mr. Kelly has with Agent Morcell are not recorded, and so we're never going to know the exact words that Mr. Kelly used in this case. And this is the first of a very unfortunate theme in this case, the theme of words being changed, of meanings being misunderstood, of statements being twisted. And we will see this again. Agent Marcel, eventually, he sends his agents out there, the sheriff's department, they're going out there to investigate this offense, to see what's happening. They get out there and they begin to search the area. The deputies who are searching the area are themselves carrying rifles because they're told the nature of the call, there may be armed people, there may be shots fired, so they're taking precautions. The deputies walk all over Mr. Kelly's property. They fan out in this area near where Mr. Kelly said he was shooting. They spread out and they walk through it. They walk through the pasture that's out there, the yard, they go beyond Mr. Kelly's two fences, all the way back into where the wash is. Multiple deputies are out there searching that area. They're looking for people who might be hiding, people who might be hurt. They're looking for people who might be under trees or under bushes. They're looking in washes. They're looking for people who might be on the ground. And they don't find anybody. They don't find anybody who's injured or hiding. They don't find anybody who's dead or dying. They don't find anybody at all. They don't find any sign of the men that Mr. Kelly described or anybody else. Everybody's gone. They find Mr. Kelly, and then they briefly talk with Mr. Kelly about what happened. Deputies, a number of them, talk to Mr. Kelly. They talk to Wanda. They don't record their interactions. They don't you know, record the conversations. So we don't know, again, exactly what is said. And here we see words that get changed. We see differences in different reports. It's very unclear what was actually said, and because nothing was recorded, we don't know what was actually said. Nobody at this point did a thorough interview with Mr. Kelly or his wife. This was brief. They were generally searching for people. They didn't find any people, and when they figured we didn't find any people, there's really not much for us to do here. We'll document the incident, and we'll go home. So. Nobody ever sat down with either Mr. Kelly or Wanda and said, talk me through this. Let's take this one step at a time. Let's go through this slowly. While you talk, I'll, I'll ask you some clarifying questions if I have them. If I, if I hear something that I think is wrong, I'm going to tell you, and you can tell me if I misunderstand that. Nobody ever did that at this point with Mr. Kelly or his wife, and nobody ever recorded any other interactions with Mr. Kelly or his wife out there. Law enforcement leaves. Mr. Kelly and his wife are spooked and exhausted from this incident. They're shaken, but they figure that it's over, and they're grateful that they're both unharmed. They think that's the end of it. This has already been a very long and traumatic day for the Kellys, but unfortunately, their nightmare's just beginning at this point. Later that evening, they think this is all over. Everything's over and done with. Later that evening, Mr. Kelly goes outside to check on his horse. He always brings Sonny, the horse, into the closer pastures in the evening, and this is part of his routine. He's checking on Sonny again because Sonny was very spooked during this incident, and he wants to make sure again that his horse, Sonny, is okay. Mr. Kelly's dogs, he's got two dogs, they go out with him. They go everywhere with him. Two dogs are always with Mr. Kelly when he's out on his property. He goes outside and he's getting his horse taken care of and squared away for the night, and then he notices that his dogs are looking at something. 
his dogs are circling around something in the grass. And this is about 115 yards away from his house. This is outside of two separate fences. You go outside of the house onto the patio, there's a fence, there's a pasture, there's another fence. We're beyond the second fence, very far away from Mr. Kelly's house. He goes up to see what the dogs are looking at. And he approaches and he sees the body of Gabriel Quenbutimea. When he sees that body, he freezes. He, one of those moments again where time sort of stands still for Mr. Kelly, he thinks, oh my goodness, He's just discovered a body on his property. He sees his dogs sniffing and nudging the body. He notices the body seems to be stiff. And his background tells him this person might have rigor mortis of some kind. It's, he's stiff. He notices the dogs and he sees the limbs are stiff. The sun's going down at this point. It's almost dark. He, he's looking at the body. He sees this is a man. He sees this man is wearing a camouflage backpack. It's not a big backpack like the group that he saw earlier. This isn't in the place where he saw the group earlier. And he notices there's a camouflage fanny pack also next to the body, hanging down, not really attached to anything. And he's remembering that single shot that he heard earlier in the day before he went outside. That single shot is coming back to him. He's in shock. He stands frozen. He's never found a body before. He's never seen a dead person before. He doesn't know what to do, but a million thoughts are racing through his mind. He knows he fired shots earlier. He knows the body's on his property. He knows that somebody might be thinking to blame this on him. He is scared out of his mind. He's remembering again that single shot that he heard. He also knows there might be people around him. He doesn't know if he's alone. He doesn't know who else is out there. Obviously, tons of people were on his property throughout the day, and he doesn't know if anybody else is out there. He is scared. In spite of this fear, he calls for help. In spite of knowing, oh my gosh, this might come back on me, he calls for help. He does the right thing. He calls the ranch liaison because that's who he calls. That's the call that he makes whenever he's seeing something go on on his property. So he calls Jeremy Marcel, Agent Marcel. He has faith that this can be investigated, law enforcement will handle this, and everything's going to be okay. That faith turns out to be very misplaced. When he calls Agent Marcel, and again, no phone call to Agent Marcel is actually recorded. Agent Marcel remembers these conversations a certain way. Mr. Kelly remembers these conversations a different way. We don't know what was actually said because we don't have a recording. But he calls Agent Marcel. He says something, this is very bad. Send the sheriff out here. Send help out here now. According to Agent Marcel, he's saying something may have been struck earlier. That's what Agent Marcel says that Mr. Kelly says. Mr. Kelly's in shock, he's scared, he sounds serious. Agent Marcel has never heard him like this before. He says he doesn't want to talk over the phone. He still doesn't know who might be listening or who might be out there. Agent Marcel calls another Border Patrol agent. He calls an Agent Layugan, and he relays that information to Agent Layugan. Agent Layugan calls the Sheriff's Department and says something that influences very seriously the way law enforcement responds to this call. Agent Layugan whether on purpose or by accident, but in a very big way, changes Mr. Kelly's words. <coughs> Mr. Kelly, according to Agent Morcell, who spoke with Mr. Kelly, said, something may have been struck. I need you to, something may have been struck earlier. Agent Layugan takes that, and he says to the dispatcher, the homeowner's reporting, I may have struck something. He said, I may have struck something. Not what Mr. Kelly said. Makes a big difference, though. Makes all the difference, possibly. This is the first, not the last, example of words being changed. <coughs> this monumental statement goes to the dispatcher with the Sheriff's Department. This is the person who's responsible for telling the deputies who are going out there, responsible for telling them, here's what you're going to see, here's what you're going to encounter, this is the call that came in. So when she gets on the radio to tell the deputies to go out there, she's saying, you know, the homeowner says he may have shot someone. Now it's not may have struck someone, it's he may have shot someone. That's what the homeowner said. I may have shot someone. 
not what Mr. Kelly said. That's what law enforcement hears when they're on their way to answer this call. And that affects the way the deputies approach this call when they get out there. The deputies are viewing this case one way and one way only. And this is their first step in the investigation. This big change influences and establishes the bias in the investigation against Mr. Kelly. The dispatch then calls Mr. Kelly to talk to him. You heard that call, and you're gonna hear that call again. Mr. Kelly is nervous and in shock, but he answers the phone and he speaks to the lady who's doing the dispatch. Mr. Kelly cannot bring himself to tell her that there's a dead person on his property. He's scared, he's in shock. He's never found a dead body before. He can't say the words. There is a dead person here. I'm looking at a dead person. That's hard, it's very, very hard. They're not coming out, it's not working. So he tries to tell her a different way and that call reflects that. He tells her he doesn't want to get in trouble, he doesn't want to get her in trouble. He says these things, he does, he says these things. And he says these things because in that moment of shock and fear of, and discovery, he's thinking, they might think I did this. They might think I did this. And he's right. And his fear is reasonable. So when he makes those comments in his shock and in his fear, and somebody who's not troubled by this wouldn't make those comments. Somebody who's not troubled by this would say, I found a dead body. He, he's troubled by this. He's scared. He doesn't know what to do. He's rattled beyond anything. Dispatch keeps asking him questions, and he communicates to Dispatch that there is a body out there. He says it in so many ways without actually using the words, because he can't use the words. But you can tell from that phone call that he's struggling, and he's trying to communicate this fact so that he can get some help. He says, there's the body of an animal, you know, as opposed to a vegetable or a minute. You know what I'm saying. He's trying to get dispatch to acknowledge what he's saying. He's not trying to treat anybody like within an inhumane manner. He's trying to communicate the facts in the only way that he can to find the words to do so. Eventually, he references the dead woman, the woman that he and Mrs. Kelly had heard about on that trip when Mr. Kelly was in the White Mountains. He says, remember that situation. Come on, dispatcher. You're going to understand it now. Remember that situation. That's what we have here. You know, the body. Okay. Dispatch finally gets it. And he doesn't want to use this word either because he's still outside. He still doesn't know who might be around him or who might be listening. When dispatch sends out the deputies, she tells the deputies that Mr. Kelly was being evasive when he had this conversation with her. So that's another example of bias in this characterization of Mr. Kelly's words as being evasive. She could have used a different word. She could have said, he sounds scared. He sounds like he's in shock. He sounds like he's afraid to speak to me directly. He sounds hesitant to use certain words. She chose the word evasive, and she spread that characterization to the deputies who were responding to the scene. So now the deputies think, we're going to go talk to this guy who's been evasive and who says he admitted he might have shot someone. Not at all the way Mr. Kelly reported this, but that's what the deputies are thinking when they go out there. When the deputies arrive, Mr. Kelly takes them to where the body is. And you'll note, he has a conversation with Deputy Lopez, who's the first one out there on the scene who talks to him. And once law enforcement is there, Mr. Kelly says, there's a person, there's a body, there's a person, he is over there. He's, he uses that language now that he knows there's somebody else who's there on the scene. The deputies that get there can see that there's a single gunshot wound, a single shot going through the side of the body and coming out through the chest. All right, um, sorry to interrupt you, but we do need to take an afternoon break. So we'll take the break now, um, take about a 15 minute break. Um, I know some of you would wanted to see the jury commissioner, Mount Pablo Guzman, maybe about related to work and what you have to submit. So I'm seeing if we can come up now and talk to you for, during this break. If not, we'll put them together with you uh, first thing next week. All right, we'll take a 15 minute recess. We'll come back in about 3 o'clock. We'll continue with the office later.
out to find out what's happening. Guys, time travel time. It's a better argument. A lot better argument. But is it the best argument? You know, who did it? Who done it? You know, who done it? It, it doesn't... Uh, I am awake for the... T- Why does it keep going off? I shut it. So it's... Uh, I mean, it's a who done it now because they're saying, well, it wasn't him. And, these, and I think it's a great argument. The cartels are running around with guns. I mean, it, the biggest problem he has, though, is, yeah, he did crank off around in the middle of the, like, you know, where it was dark out and he shot above their heads. Like, that is a bit of a problem. So, um, why am I glowing red? That's my muted, so, uh, my favorite producer. We're, we're, we've got it. We're, we're, we're doing professional production quality here, chat. So, um, we might have to turn that down to 1% out there, sweetheart. I'll have to figure that out. Anyways, um. Yeah, this is a like this is a good argument. It's it's like it's a little more engaging. Um, the problem is for the defense because they spend so much time talking about it. Um, you know they have to spend all the time the state did because the state just made all like talk forever and ever and ever. This is a lot more streamlined, but yeah, I wish they didn't have to do this because this it turns into trial by uh, opening statement, and um, I think she's doing better. Um, do they check the horse for gunshot residue? I don't know if they would. I don't know if they would. Hold on one second. So, um, a bigger problem is that germ spreader in the courtroom. Yeah. So, I don't know. And Luke says, you'll see, I think they make a better identity case going on. Yeah. Um, what is seen and what's, what's been seen and heard? Yeah. But I think ultimately, like, yeah, it, this is a shitty situation. And once again, this is why you don't talk to the cops. But George Kelly's a dumb fucking boomer. And guess what he does? I love the police. I'm good market. I'm a good old fed boy like y'all are. And, uh, yeah, they don't, they, uh, that doesn't work out that way. So. So we don't talk to the cops. I mean, I think he's got a decent shot, but it's still, it's, it's a coin flip at the end of the day, man. It's 50, 50 blue devil, 70. Good to see you, man. I don't think I've seen you around before. If I, if you have been around, I apologize, but uh, welcome. I mean, it's, it's, it's a coin flip and you catch it and guilty, not guilty with the jury. Juries are highly unpredictable. That's why you don't ever want to be in the position of relying on a jury. So, yeah, but he's got a chance. I just don't know. I mean, I, I'd say no better than 50-50, but yeah, he's got a fight and shot at this. Um, so, yes, we love our Mexicans. We love our cartels. Oh, they're so good. Oh, they're so sweet. All right, let's get back to the let's get back to finishing this up. And we'll be finished kind of early, guys, so we'll be ready for uh, Mr. Medicare stream a little early tonight, but we're going to go through this. Let's keep going. They care. No. They don't care. They've got their guy. They're not interested in other other possibilities. Shortly after that, that's Miguel. Shortly after Miguel, you have Ramon. Ramon shows up. Ramon is picked up in I believe Sonoida for alien smuggling. He's trafficking people through somewhere and Border Patrol picks him up. And after he gets arrested, he says, hey, I was there, I was there. They take a statement from Ramon, they talk to him. Ramon says some things that are concerning. He says he recognizes Mr. Kelly from the news. He says, I saw this on the news. And that's, and I recognize him because I saw him on the news. I was, I was there. He makes some more statements that contradict objective physical evidence in the case. Many such statements that contradict objective physical evidence in the case. Many such statements that are verifiably false based on what law enforcement knows about the scene and about what took place. Does law enforcement pursue that? Do they challenge Ramon? Do they consider Ramon to be a possible suspect? 
Did I ask questions about why now not one person but two people have come forward to say, Mr. Kelly did it, he's the bad guy, and those statements don't match up with anything and they seem to be false statements. Is that a concern for law enforcement? No, they have their guy. They don't need to worry about investigating other things. So we get Miguel, we get Ramon, then we get Daniel. Daniel comes forward in a very controlled manner. This is controlled by Gabriel's family and controlled by a supposed family member who goes by the name of Juan Carlos Rodriguez. That person somehow communicates with the sheriff's department and that person says, okay, we, we found someone. We have someone who was with Gabriel when he died. It's, it's this guy, it's Daniel. Okay, so the family arranges for Daniel to come talk to law enforcement about what happened. And then we have another strange thing occur in this case. The sheriff, Sheriff Hathaway himself personally, decides to get involved in this case. And Sheriff Hathaway himself personally, as part of this investigation, goes into Mexico to conduct this criminal investigation. And he goes in there, the evidence is going to show twice. First time to just meet with the family members, um, but he goes into Mexico to do that and doesn't document that meeting until much, much later, after he's told, you, you didn't document this, you got to document this. And then he goes with another detective, so Sheriff Hathaway goes himself personally with a detective, Barba. They travel into Mexico to have this criminal investigation, to conduct this criminal investigation. The evidence is going to show that there's no legal authority for the sheriff to do that. The evidence is going to show that Sheriff Hathaway did not go through any diplomatic channels in order to conduct an investigation in Mexico. He didn't liaise with any Mexican official, didn't do anything. He just went into Mexico to meet with the witness at a hotel across the line. He went with Detective Barba, as I mentioned. Gabriel has two adult daughters who were present at the meeting. This Juan Carlos Rodriguez person was there. They're all in this interview with Daniel. That interview takes about 45 minutes. They talk to Daniel. They don't record that interview. After the interview is finished, Sheriff Hathaway records a summary of the interview. So he gets the witness to essentially say again, tell us again what you just told this detective, but now we're going to record you. That recording lasts six minutes. So that's the documentation that they did of the interview that took place in Mexico with Daniel. After that interview, Daniel provides numerous other interviews, and Daniel testifies in a preliminary hearing in this case. Over the course of these numerous interviews, it becomes clear that DRR, Daniel, <laughs> I'm used to using his initials, Daniel, he continuously changes and adjusts his story. And it's also very apparent that Daniel is handled by whoever's interviewing him very differently from how Mr. Kelly was handled. If Daniel says something that's verifiably false, for example, he gets an opportunity to explain it. He gets an opportunity to clarify. And inevitably, if he is caught in an outright lie, which does happen, he'll claim that he just misunderstood the question. That's what, that's what he does. The evidence will show that he makes many claims that are in fact verifiably false and that his claims are never challenged. He's always given the benefit of the doubt. Daniel's claims are contradicted by numerous other pieces of evidence in this case that we've, I want you to watch out for while you're hearing this, this evidence. He's contradicted by other witness statements. So Miguel and Ramon tend to contradict him as well as Mr. and Mrs. Kelly. He contradicts his own claims by changing what he says over time, and his claims are contradicted by the physical evidence in the case. I'm not going to go into every single inconsistency that Daniel has now. I just, while you're listening to him testify, I want you to ask yourself, how does what he says actually match up with the physical evidence in this case? And the evidence is going to show that his statements do not match up. The evidence is going to show that it's in fact impossible to believe that Daniel was present when Gabriel was shot. For example, right off the bat, Daniel says all of this happened west of Nogales. 
Mr. Kelly's property is east of Nogales. Daniel's asked numerous times, where did this happen? East or west of Nogales? West. Not possible. Daniel states that after he was shot, Gabriel fell over backwards and landed on his side or on his back after he was shot. Also, not possible. Bodies found on the stomach. So if DRR is telling the truth and he fell over backwards, then after Gabriel was shot, he, his body was turned over. And that changes everything too. It's not possible to believe what Daniel says. Daniel also says that right after the shooting took place, Mr. Kelly stood over Gabriel's body. That Daniel saw that. He looked back, he was close, he saw him. He saw Mr. Kelly standing right there over Gabriel's body. The evidence is going to show that that is not possible. Not only is this 115 yards away from where Mr. Kelly was when he was firing, in order for Mr. Kelly to stand over Gabriel's body, he has to climb over two barbed wire fences and cover that distance in a very short time at his age. That's not possible. The evidence is going to show that. The evidence is going to show that Mr. Kelly is actually seen on camera by Border Patrol in a very different area after this shooting happens. Nowhere near where Gabriel is found. Daniel also says that this shooting happened right next to the border wall. He says we were 15 meters away from the border wall. It was right there when this shooting happened. Not possible. This took place over a mile, or a mile and a half as the crow flies away from the border wall. Daniel also says that a horse was shot and killed in this incident. Not just shot, shot and killed. And he stuck with that shot and killed and the horse fell down and I saw the horse fall down. Where's the dead horse? Not possible. Sounds like they're missing a Daniel dead horse. Daniel also <laughs> says that Gabriel was not wearing a two-way radio. He says, I was there, I was with Gabriel. He was just a migrant looking for the American dream. He was not wearing a radio. Not possible. Gabriel was wearing a radio. Daniel will also say that he and Gabriel, right before the shooting happened, they were right next to a road. And he got specific. He said it's the road that Border Patrol uses to get to the end of the wall. It's the road that goes to the end of the wall. Not possible. There is a road that Border Patrol uses. There is a road. Wow. It's, it's interesting. The prosecutor knew this was all there. And they're not challenging it. They didn't bring up, you know, Kelly... Ad, like adultering the crime scene at all and adding a radio. Now apparently there should have been a dead horse. Oh boy. Sounds like there's some bullshit witnesses here. Sounds like there's some bullshit witnesses here. Hmm. Sorry. No, oof. Looking good for defense. It goes to the end of the wall. It's not on Mr. Kelly's property. It's further away. So not possible. There are many, many of these examples, but we'll wait to see what Daniel actually has to say. The biggest three examples of these impossible statements are that the horse was shot and killed, that Mr. Kelly stood over Gabriel's body, and that this happened right next to the wall. If the horse wasn't hit, you must have quit. huge. Those are not explainable by any conclusion other than Daniel was not there. Daniel did not witness this at all. There are other instances of Daniel misrepresenting things to law enforcement or changing his story as time goes on. At first, when he meets up with um, Sheriff Hathaway and Detective Barba, he says that Gabriel was the smuggler. Gabriel was leading the group. Later, he changed his story. No, Gabriel wasn't the smuggler. He just wanted the American dream. It was this other guy. I don't know his name. El Cholo. It was El Cholo. He was leading the group. That's what Daniel says. During an investigation where Daniel is talking to the detectives at the county attorney's office, they ask Daniel, have you ever transported drugs into the United States? Important question. You can see, see what this guy's background is. Have you ever transported drugs into the United States? Daniel says, no, never. I've never done that. Well, turns out he has. That was not true. He lied about that in this investigation. The defense's investigation revealed that Daniel had been convicted in federal court 
of transporting marijuana into the United States. He took a plea in federal court under oath where he admitted that he transported drugs into the United States. And he did some time in federal prison as a result of that offense. When he was confronted with this information later, well, I just misunderstood the question. I thought, I thought when you asked me, have I ever transported drugs into the United States, I thought what you meant was, did I have any drugs with me when I was with Gabriel? Does that go challenged? No. No, that explanation is perfectly accepted by law enforcement. Daniel also stated under oath that he had not met with anybody to talk about this case until he was testifying about it. That was not true. When he made that statement, he had already had two separate meetings with law enforcement to talk about the case. And whenever he's questioned about any of these statements, he just says, well, I misunderstood the question. I, I didn't get it. I, I, I didn't understand what you were saying. And law enforcement just accepts those explanations. Nobody from law enforcement ever doubted or questioned Daniel's story. Daniel's statements in this investigation were always accepted as fact, and they were never subjected to any kind of meaningful scrutiny. In fact, maybe you won't be surprised by this, but law enforcement changed Daniel's statements, they changed his words to make those words fit into their story. Daniel did an interview with a detective at the county attorney's office, and the detective was translating what Daniel said to the prosecutor. He was asked in Spanish, where did this happen, east or west of Nogales? He said, west. The detective who was questioning him in Spanish said, oeste, west? Daniel said, yes. The detective translated that, east. He said, east. That's a problem. This keeps happening in this investigation. And that is a problem. Never, in spite of all of this coming out, does law enforcement ever seem to question if they have the right guy. They never seem to question what is going on with this witness. I'm going to leave Daniel for a minute here, but again, I want to come back to the big three. The three things he said that are impossible to believe. A horse was shot and killed when this happened. Impossible to believe. Mr. Kelly was standing over Gabriel's body right after this happened. Impossible to believe. And this happened right next to the border wall, 15 meters away. Impossible to believe. So keep that in mind when you're listening to this testimony, when you're evaluating this testimony. I want to talk very briefly just about the forensics that you will hear in this case. Because eventually law enforcement gets around to doing some forensic analysis of the scene. And the evidence is going to show there are some shell casings on the patio outside of Mr. Kelly's house. And the forensic evidence is going to show that there's a lot that we just can't know, that no, we just can't prove forensically. <coughs> Biggest thing is there's no bullet. And when there's no bullet, there's no proof. We can't prove that Mr. Kelly's rifle fired the shot that hit Gabriel. We can't prove it. We can't prove that his rifle did not fire the shot either. You can't prove it either way. There's, there's nothing to hang your hat on forensically to say for sure here's what happened or didn't happen in this case. The forensics can't prove or find out who fired the single shot, the shot that Mr. Kelly heard. Who fired that single shot that killed Gabriel? We don't know. Which direction did that shot come from? We don't know. You heard the state say that because the bullet comes in here and it comes out here and he's lying on his stomach, well, it comes from the direction of the house. That's where it came from. We don't know that. We don't know how Gabriel was standing when he got hit. We don't know if he was standing when he got hit. We don't know if he took steps before he fell. We don't know if he perhaps fell over backwards, the way Daniel described it, and then was either rolled over or rolled over. We don't know any of that. There's no forensic evidence that can tell us this is how Gabriel was standing before he got shot, or even this is where he was before he got shot. We don't have that evidence. And who is Gabriel, and what was Gabriel doing there? Again, there's a lot that's unknown about Gabriel, about who he is and what he was doing there. All we have is the evidence, and we look at that evidence. The witness, Daniel, says Gabriel's looking for the American dream. He's a migrant, he wants to work, and he's just traveling unarmed, doing nothing, and suddenly Mr. Kelly starts firing at him. The physical evidence tells another story. The physical evidence shows that he's carrying a radio. 
we're going to hear about radios. He's carrying a radio. He's carrying camouflage, his backpack and his fanny pack are camouflage. The phone, when Gabriel had a phone, they examined the phone. There are some photographs of Gabriel's activity on that phone. And you're going to see photographs of Gabriel on dates that are different from January 30th. You're going to see photographs of Gabriel from prior occasions on prior dates. In those photographs, you're going to see Gabriel wearing the same, same clothing. Same clothing he's wearing when he dies. He's wearing on other occasions, different occasions. You're going to see him carrying a fanny pack. You're going to see him carrying it in front of him, going across his body like that. Not down at his side, not dangling off of his backpack. He carries it across his body. Photographs will show that. The photographs are going to show Gabriel standing up high on a mountaintop somewhere. Fanny pack across his chest. Radio. He's got his radio again on that date. Binoculars. He's carrying binoculars this time, too. What's he doing? I think we can make an inference about that. So, who is Gabriel and what's he doing on Mr. Kelly's property? Pictures are worth a thousand words. And the pictures show that Gabriel is not somebody who's looking for the American dream. This is somebody who is engaged in trafficking. He's engaged in illegal activity. And I'm not talking about just coming across as an illegal alien. I'm talking about either scouting or smuggling, trafficking people, trafficking drugs. We don't know. But he's trafficking. He's involved in that world. And at the end of the day, the evidence is going to show that Gabriel is living a criminal lifestyle, and criminal lifestyles are dangerous. The evidence will show that there's one shot fired before Mr. Kelly leaves his house, and Gabriel died as a result of one shot. One shot, one bullet hole. That's what the evidence is going to show. The person responsible for firing that single shot is also the person responsible for Gabriel's death that day. And that person is not Mr. Kelly. Law enforcement had a bias going into this investigation, and they wrapped the evidence around Mr. Kelly. They decided he was guilty, and they made it work. They didn't let the evidence lead them to their conclusions. They let their predetermined conclusions lead them to their interpretations of the evidence. And this is why, at the end of this, we will be asking all of you to render a not guilty verdict in this case. We're asking that each one of you listen to each witness very carefully. You heard my co-counsel yesterday talk to you about, they start with a clean slate, you take them as they are, you start with no preconceived notions, listen to what they say, compare what they say to the other evidence in the case. We're asking that you not make the same mistake law enforcement did. Don't start with the mindset that Mr. Kelly shot this person. Start with the mindset of wanting to seek the truth, of wanting to go where the evidence leads, not the other way around. And we're asking you especially to consider the physical evidence in this case. Everybody has statements. Statements need to be tested against the physical evidence. That's the most important thing, the facts. Very particularly, we want you to understand the distance from Mr. Kelly's patio to where this body was eventually located. Pay close attention to all the photographs that you see, the drone footage that you see of this property, and pay close attention to the number of obstacles that are in between where Mr. Kelly was standing and where Gabriel was eventually discovered. You're going to see pergola uh, legs, you're going to see smokers, you're going to see many, many trees, you're going to see wood piles, you're going to see fences, you're going to see dozens and dozens of obstacles in between where Mr. Kelly was standing and where Gabriel's body was eventually discovered. And you're, you know, you're not going to see any of those obstacles. You're not going to see a bullet hole. You're not going to see any lead residue any of those obstacles. The state is going to try to convince you that Mr. Kelly fired nine shots through this field of obstacles with the intent of hitting Gabriel, who he can barely see from the patio and who he can't see from inside the house. The state is going to try to convince you that nine shots went through this field of obstacles and left no bullet holes and no lead residue. 
There's a broken branch in this field of obstacles. A single broken branch. This is a pasture. This field of obstacles is in a pasture. Animals all over this place all the time. In that broken branch, again, there's no bullet hole, there's no lead residue, there's no evidence whatsoever that that branch was hit by a bullet. There's no evidence that any bullets went through this field of obstacles, let alone nine of them. So keep the physical evidence in mind, keep the forensic evidence in mind when you're listening to witnesses tell their stories. Keep other witness statements in mind to compare with the witnesses that you're hearing. And keep the known facts of the case in mind to, to have in mind when you're listening to people testify. The facts that can't be disputed. Have those in mind when you're listening to the witnesses. The state in this case is going to ask you to speculate about motives and meanings. He sent this text message. Here's what he meant. This is what he thought. This is what he felt. They're going to ask you to make subjective determinations about what certain phrases mean. They're going to ask you to make subjective determinations about what somebody feels or what somebody thinks. We're not going to ask you to do that. We're going to ask you to not speculate. We're going to ask you to rely on the facts of this case, the facts, the things that we know. And finally, before I wrap up, I just want all of you to remember, co-counsel talked about it yesterday, but. Remember who has the burden of proof. This table has the burden of proof. This table has to prove to you, prove to you, that Mr. Kelly shot Gabriel. We don't have to prove that he didn't. And we don't have to prove that he's innocent. All right, it's their job to prove that he shot Gabriel. And they can't do it. And remember why the burden of proof is the way that it is. We're asking you at the end of this trial, after hearing all this evidence, to render a not guilty verdict. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Larkin. Uh, can we get counsel on uh, head for a second? Please. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the jury, we're about to adjourn in a moment. Um, <clears throat> I am going to do something that I neglected to do right after you were sworn, but it's, uh, it's brief. I'm going to read you the formal charge in this case. This is the charge from what's called the information. Oh, sorry, guys. Now you can hear me. Sorry. So the charge and the information is the formal statement of what the charges are against this particular defendant. The caption of the case is always a caption of the case as the name of the case is State of Arizona Plaintiff versus George L. Kelly Defendant. It reads as follows. In the name and by the authority of the state of Arizona, George Allen Kelly, date of birth, 127-1949, accused by the county attorney of Santa Cruz County, state of Arizona, by this information, filed with the clerk of the above titled court this 15th day of March 2024 of the crime committed as follows. Count one, second degree murder. George Allen Kelly, on or about January 30, 2023, did commit second degree murder by causing the death of GCB without premeditation. Count two, aggravated assault. It alleges George Allen Kelly, on or about January 30th, 2023, using a rifle, a deadly weapon or dangerous instrument, intentionally did place DRV, 
also known as DRR, in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury. All of the above, as set forth, con contrary to the form, force, and effect of the statute in such cases, made and provided against the peace and dignity of the state of Arizona, signed by Ms. Kimberly J. Hunley, Chief Deputy County Attorney. All right, we're going to recess for the day. The admonition to the long weekend, three days. We're going to come back Tuesday morning. I'm going to uh, order that you be present in the jury room Tuesday morning at 8.30 assembly. Once again, we can't do anything until you're all present, so please all be punctual. <clears throat> okay, guys, so that's it. Um, so is, is he 70 years old? He's 75. So, yeah, guys, this is not an impressive. This is what the state's got. This is disgusting. Really, I hope there's more to it than that. So, yeah, the white noise, that's what they use when they want to try to make everything quiet so nobody can hear them. Yes, Juror 13. Yes, he's filming milk during the sidebars. So, guys, yeah, that's so that's it. This is a... This looks like a garbage prosecution. I mean, damn. This guy... I, I, I was kind of torn because it sounds like Something must have happened. I mean, really, he talked. If he hadn't talked, this wouldn't have been a big deal. But, uh, yeah, it's a political trial. He has a number of aliases, some of which may not be real, yeah. But is it a problem if he heard a shot and there's a standard ground law? Well, remember, the standard ground stuff doesn't apply anymore. There's, like, duty to retreat, Sure. But even then, this is why you don't talk. He added so much, and he gave them so much information that it took that it took the meter from like this is an okay shoot, and he pushed it on his own all the way into that. Um, his his defense should be no way he could hit anything at 150 yards. That's not acceptable defense. You're shooting a rifle, so you could hit something at 150 yards. Um, you don't want to make that game of you're falling willy nilly, because you your respond your actions are knowing if there's a reasonable likelihood that you know what's going to happen. I could hit that guy. So, yes, the definition of alias is not your real name. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, it sounds like you killed a guy who's a big piece of shit, but you know you got to do it legally and you shut the fuck up and you know, you don't get prosecuted. So. Yeah, I'm sure the defense is going to fuck these guys up pretty good. Is there a sensible way to inform the police? Yes, there is. Well, you might want to contact an attorney, and they might, and if they tell you straight up, call the police, go ahead, call the police. But you say, I found him here, and I didn't do shit to it. I found him here. That's it. That's all you're going to say. Don't answer any other questions until you talk to an attorney. Islands is required to report a body, depending on your state, yes. That might be an issue. I can't tell you for sure. Uh, but yes, you found a dead person. Yeah, there, you might have an obligation to report it. So, the danger is, like, let's say they find out that you knew and you didn't report, then, ooh, boy. Shoot, shovel, and shut up is a thing, yeah, but are you sure that's going to be 100% workable? You know what I mean? Those cops going to Mexico and not recording is an issue. Yep, and I, I'm sure that's all going to... This case is going to come out as shoddy and shitty at the end of the day. It's also going to help these guys really didn't want to go after them. I can see that, like... Oh, I can see that becoming an issue for them. The state. So, yeah, this is just... Guys, this is another example of be fucking careful what you fucking do. I'm betting in hindsight now we wish he hadn't have fucking cranked off a round over their heads. I mean, th this is... Don't do dumb shit like that. You know, this is why you don't do that. This is why you don't do that. Or if you're going to crank a round off, you crank it off into the ground in front of you. You know, something. Or maybe, it, like, something like that. But that's... Do you have an obligation to call 911? No, because it's not an emergency. You could call the police and say, hey, I found a body on my property. You know, you could do it that way. Sean, do you know he fired in their direction? Well, 
I mean, presume I I don't know for sure, but it sounds like he said he did. He said like, and I mean that that makes it almost even worse, James. If he says, well, how do you know what direction he fired in? I don't know what direction they were in, so I just started shooting randomly into the night. Do you see how that sounds? Because that's what the prosecutor is gonna say. Yo, know, Catherine says, really, they pointed his gun at him. Yeah, they pointed guns at him, just not that specific moment. So. Like I said, guys, this is a, uh, you know, that that's, you got to be careful about it. You got to be careful. You have to make sure you do this right. And there's ways you could do stuff, and there's ways I wouldn't recommend doing stuff. Cranking off rounds in the middle of the night, I would never recommend that. Yeah, he's saying he shot a different group in a different spot. Yeah, and I get that, but it's just this whole thing is just a fucking mess. And he talked way too much. If he hadn't talked, this wouldn't have been a problem. Yes, Luke for uh, two, almost three loonies is saying, uh, two loonies 79 is saying, must not have been shut the fuck up Friday for him. Yeah. And I, like I said, I'm sure he's a dumb boomer who's like, oh, I love the cops. I'm a good, Amer I'm a great American. So are they great Americans? You know, these colors don't run. I'm back to blue. I'm sure that's him in a nutshell. I'm sure that's him in a nutshell. Well, hopefully he fucking learned that's not the case anymore. And and Ghost Street says good day. Good day. So guys, we will be covering uh well we're not covering it, but I mean I'll be watching Medicare tonight. Eight o'clock. I'll be on a couple minutes early. If you guys are interested, you can join me. And uh obviously there's not a lot to talk about because Jim does his thing and we all just we sit and listen for the hat man to the hat man to talk to us. So, you know, Jim, Jim needs, a, Jim needs the support. Can always buy a hat for your hat, guys. Do Delphi, like I said, I would? Yeah, Delphi's gonna be afterwards. So, fucking ice, you need to ice your titties down. Take your titties and apply some ice to them. Daddy will do it. It's gonna be a minute, though. So, How do they prove he did it? Because he fucking talked. That's how they're proving he did it. Because he's got inconsistent statements and he, his shit's not matching up. That's how they do it. Well, I cover the two jailhouse calls he live-streamed. Who, who? You mean Chili? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we can go over those. Um, your titties are smoking hot? Well, then you'll do it. So... But prove his bullet killed someone? Yeah, I don't know, guys. Like I said, it, the state has done a shitty case, so I don't know what they're going to be able to prove going forward. We'll find out, though. So, guys, that is it for tonight. We are going to wrap this up. Um, But, yeah, we'll work on chili stuff at some point. So, that is kind of the... That's kind of the end for us tonight. Your titties run hot like his AK. Well, we will do Richard Allen tonight, and it's getting uh, it's getting very interesting. Getting very interesting, and yeah, it's not looking good for him. But I, I just yeah. So we'll see you guys tonight after the Medicare stream over on Locals, guys at potentiallycriminal.locals.com. But then after that, we'll be on over here. And Jim ends usually about 10 or pretty close to it, so we'll start up right after that. Um, and then we'll go over the Richard Allen stuff we got. And then tomorrow, I'm um, going to be on with uh, D. Sleazy on... Uh, what's the show? What, what are we doing here? Hold on. Tomorrow, I'm going to be on... Uh, I'm going to be on with... Uh, Sleazy Society at 2, kind of talking about Acer Thorn and some other things that are going on out there. So I'll be at 2 p.m. here on YouTube. So. Okay, and guys, apparently Hell is on right now. I'm going to send you guys all over there. 
Give me one second here and I'll set that up. Oh, come on. Once again, guys, if you see Nico or run into him, tell him thank you for the... the thank you for the song if you guys like it because it is his and it's a very... I think it's a very good idea. So here we go, guys. I'll see you guys later tonight. Yeah, so hell is going to be on at 6.30, guys. Going through Alex Murdaugh's emails, jail emails. Should be some good stuff there. So I will see you guys tonight around 10. Take care.